I'd like to call this meeting of the Board of Education for the School District of Baraboo to order for Monday, April the 9th, 2012, with roll call. Mr. Borkenhagen. Here. Mr. Cummings. Here. Mr. McNevin. Here. Mr. Meering. Here. Mr. Mortimer. Here. Mr. Pedro. Here. And Bodak here. Continue with the pledge, which is behind the screen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would entertain a motion that it be resolved the Board of Education approve the minutes of the March 26, 2012 meeting as printed. I will so move. Second. Motion by Cummings, seconded by Borkenhagen. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Minutes carried. Brings us to the portion of the agenda entitled Correspondence. I would just like to interject for correspondence before I ask for the rest of the board's correspondence. The election results. Uh, the election results have been certified. There were three individuals up for two seats on the board. The results of the votes, uh, 2,413 20, 2, for Mr. McNevin, 1,946 for Ms. Riley, and 1,873 for Mr. Borkenhagen. The top two will be sworn in. That would be Mr. McNevin and Ms. Riley will be sworn in as new board members and returning board members at the 23rd of April meeting. Any other board members with correspondence? I have correspondence. Uh, I'd like to read a letter uh, that was uh, posted by Mr. Andy Luther uh, by permission. Uh, over the last 30 years, uh, I have come to you as a wide-eyed college, oh, I'm sorry, over 30 years ago, I came to you, this is a former Baraboo teacher, as a wide-eyed college freshman to tell you that your rhetoric class was the most useful of all my senior classes. I stand by that statement today. The logical fallacies portion of the class gave me a nose to be able to bull ticky at 500 paces. I'm more accurate than a Swiss, a Swiss watch. Of all my high school, all my high school teachers gave me skills and gifts that I use to this day. The late Tom Brock taught me compassion. Penny Peterson, Benny Peterson taught me about integrity. Mrs. Roloff taught me to laugh at the absurd, and Bob Reed taught me to speak and write with specificity. After over 30 years, I am appreciative and appreciate all of these lessons. God, I hope I have thanked you. If not, I am doing so at this moment. I'm proud to have been your student, uh, Andy Luther. Thank you. Any other board members with correspondence? I have a couple, but I will offer those during the legislative audit. <coughs> Anyone else? Any administrative correspondence? None. Hearing none, that brings us to the portion of the agenda entitled Public Viewpoints. Do we have anyone here for public viewpoints tonight? If you would approach the microphone, and if you're here for yourself, state your name. If you're here on behalf of the group, the name of the group. My name is uh, Tim Horswell, and I'm representing H&H &H Civil Construction. Okay. We're the uh, contractor that turned in the low bid for contract A. Uh, it's my understanding at the bid opening that there's been a recommendation to award that contract to the second bidder based on that he was a local contractor. Uh, I think it's important that the board realizes that in the bid specs and the documents, there was nothing in there that stated that you had a local contractor preference. There also was nothing in there that stated that you had to be a local contractor to bid the project. Uh, when we put our bid together, we used all local subcontractors, we all, all local pipe vendors, gravel, concrete, lumber, hotel, fuel, and others to form our bid to give you the best possible price. Uh, this project is a multi-discipline project, a lot of different things to do on it. It's our opinion that even if you award it to the local contractor, the amount of work that he will self-perform is relatively small to the total contract. We are the lowest qualified bidder for this project, and it is our hope that you award it to us. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public viewpoints? Any other public viewpoints? Any other public viewpoints? 
Hearing none, I'd like to move on to our typical highlight of the evening, which is our staff and student recognition. Mm -hmm. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ritzenbauer. Okay. Um, this is my favorite part of the meeting. If we could have Jory Ruff, Brenda, and Kimberly come forward. I'll introduce you to the board. I'd um, like to start with Brenda, who's served as an assistant um, for the ELL program for a couple of years. She's been a valuable addition to the staff. She works in multiple buildings and different grade levels to support student learning. Uh, another area that she supports the district in is translation of important documents, such as uh, IEPs, progress reports, registration materials, and other important district information. She is an exemplary employee who is dedicated to, to her position. I heard many wonderful things about you from the staff, and we're very fortunate to have you with us tonight. So thank you very much. And um, her name is Kimberly Martinez, and she moved here from to the U U.S. from Mexico this past summer. She is a wonderful student, and she works very hard in the classroom. She's improved her reading fluency and comprehension in English. She excels in the area of math, and she's made incredible gains this year. She also, we just found out recently, she wrote an August Derleth. Uh, competition personal narrative and she was a winner mm -hmm. so we want to extend our congratulations to Kimberly and Kimberly I have a medal for you that says honors for excellence you can wear it proudly and be a great role model in your school Jory Ruff, who is a familiar face, and I was trying to think how many years you've been with us. Five? Um, this is my fifth, yeah. Fifth, fifth year. She's worked, um, started out as an ELL teacher, classroom teacher. She's back working in our English uh, language learner program again, provides terrific leadership, has a lot of passion for what she does, and uh, we're excited tonight because she's going to do a little demonstration of what they've been working on with technology. So I'd like to present you with a certificate to Thank you. Thank you.
Today was like any date. It was the last day of the school. I said goodbye to all my friends and came home. One day passed and upon walking the next day, I heard the church bells. I found my mom was out and went to look and listened to my cousin then all song came out. Then I heard a lot of screaming and went out and listened to my aunt Jill get inside the house and I then went back inside. Then I listened my mom talking on the phone with my brother when he she hung up and I asked her why why are people shooting shut our heart and she did not reply days gone on and almost everything was the same then one day I was playing with my cousin Daya. Then I get inside my house and heard ma my mom was talking to my sister. She said we were going to the United States. I do not give importance to that and the day passed. One day mom, my mom Tell my little sister and me, then I week we will will go to the United States. At the begin behind, I feel happy and and then sad because I was living behind my cousin and my aunt and my uncles. My grandparents were going with me and my parents. The day before we came, we prepar prepared our things and he said goodbye to my uncles and aunt. I was so sad because I will leave them be behind, behind and I will miss them and more than Anybody, I will miss my cousin Daira and my other cousin with whom home, home I was asked to have fun. The departure day came, my aunt and uncles were wearing for us, but no Daira and I have to go without said goodbye to her. I was three days grieving. We just stopped to eat something before we get to Barabu and my life changed forever. We stopped in St. Louis. When we came to Barabu, my life changed in some many ways. First, I had to learn another language and we had to buy another house. I can go outside alone. I'm inside the house all the time. I have go to school and I'm there for a lot of time. Well, this is my new life, and I feel a, a little happy and a little bit sad because I miss my son, Cheran.
great job, and I'm really um, happy to be in the Variable School District. We have so many resources. We have an excellent ELL program, um, and thank you for letting me come here today and share a little bit about that and also for all of your support. We're happy you're here in Baraboo. Yes, thank you, Kimberly. Brings us to the portion of the agenda entitled Continuous School Improvement. And up next we have Ms. Miller and some help with uh, providing us some instructional resources updates. Still getting my computer after that. Um, we're here as a celebration to share with you the processes that we've used and also um, our outcomes of the work we've done with allocation of dollars from the board to address some curriculum gaps. In the areas of allocation, we're in middle school literacy and also secondary science and social studies. And I just want to start out again by saying thank you for resources. Joy just said thank you for support. I think that's critical to help our students gain at the levels that they are. I also want to share with you that with each of these different areas, we started out by doing a needs assessment. And that's probably why it's taken this much time to come to you tonight and share our outcomes of our work and determining some of the decisions that we've made about purchasing because we wanted to make sure that we looked at what are our strengths currently with these curricular areas, what are some weaknesses, and then opportunities to grow. With that, we developed our essential learning targets, and now we're in a place where we know what resources we need to be successful with those essential learning targets. So tonight, we're going to start out with having Mr. Ganell and uh, Jane McMahon and Michelle Bradley come up and start talking about middle school literacy. One of the things I'm really excited about right now at the middle school is our efforts to create what we call a cultural literacy so that we are merging kids in the skills that they're going to need to succeed in the future. And those to me are reading, writing, uh, speaking, listening. And the more we can offer kids opportunities to do that in an authentic way, we are going to build them as citizens. And, and much of our belief is based on a book that we've been reading. This is my well-worn copy of Focus. Some of you probably have read this already uh, by Mike Schmoker. And I've had a couple of opportunities to hear him speak. And, and what I really like about this book is it breaks it down very simply. And he says, in order to achieve great gains in student achievement, what we have to do is just focus on reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And doing the things that we've already started to do with identifying the learning targets and being really, really clear about what it is we want kids to know and be able to do. And this book has had a lot of impact on our staff uh, as a small group. And we're also going to look to expand that next year in the future in bringing this book to our whole staff so that they can uh, get a, a sense of some of the direction that we're heading in in terms of literacy. And I'm really, really excited about some of the things that we put into place this year. Uh, we've got our staff engaged in literacy. We do hot reads where our staff will post what they're reading so kids can see that. I think that adult piece is really, really critical. When adults create an environment where they're showing kids the importance of ongoing learning, kids pick up on that real quickly. And I'm amazed about how many kids will be sent to my office and suddenly instead of talking about whatever it is they did, we're talking about the books that I've posted on my door. And that's pretty cool, really. We've done some other things. We've created a leadership library at school where uh, staff can exchange professional books, they can exchange uh, high interest books, they can exchange books with famous quotes in them. We have a whole library of books that staff have access to. Uh, Kelly Steiner, our media, media center, has just created a Hunger Games activity. Talk about engaging use of literature. All week long, kids were excited about that because, of course, that's a big thing for them right now. And kids were engaged in all these activities connected to the Hunger Games, and it creates that hunger to want to read that. And I know that because I've got a couple of kids at home. One's a fifth grader, uh, and he right now is absorbed with that whole series. In fact, uh, he read the second book over spring break. He says, Dad, you got to give me the third one right away. <laughs> so we got back, and we had to go to the bookstore right away and buy the third book. <clears throat> we have another exciting opportunity coming up. Leroy Butler is coming to our school, and he's written this book called From Wheelchair to Lambo Leap, and talks about his life and his experience starting out in very dire circumstances. He was in a wheelchair much of his youth. Uh, he was born into poverty in Jacksonville, Florida, and talks about his rise to stardom in college football and then on to the NFL. But he actually created the Lambo Leap 
and he's going to come to Jack Young Middle School on Friday. He's going to share his story. He's going to focus on some of the things that we're really trying to engage our kids in with PBIS, things like respect, responsibility, treating of one another with kindness, and he's going to focus on how he uses his positive attitude everywhere he goes to create a better community wherever he is. He's really going to focus on that message with our kids on Friday. He's going to be in our IMC talking about his book. Kelly Steiner's been in every class at the middle school uh, this week promoting the book, some of the lessons she learned from it. And it just creates this feeling where kids are connecting to those important skills of reading, writing, listening, and discussing things on a very high level. And we're really excited about that. Okay, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we came about deciding what to order with this allocation. Um, Lori uh, presented this dollar amount to us, to a few, select few of us at the beginning of the year, and said, don't tell everyone what it is right now because they'll go crazy. Um, well, I was kind of thinking about it in my mind. That is a lot, of, a big allocation, but from what I understand, the middle school is in, in very dire need of the new resources to support the learning targets and the Common Core Standards. We formed a committee early in the fall, um, w along with Mr. Gunnell, and we called it the Middle School Literacy Committee. We've been meeting since last October, and Lori's been also a good leader in that committee. Um, we talked about what sort of gaps exist, and we figured out what the gaps were in our curriculum and resource materials by um, first completing an inventory of what is there, and then giving our teachers a needs assessment and just finding out, gathering data, what do they have, what do they need to be successful. We took that data, brought it to the committee, analyzed it, found what sorts of needs existed for technology, for um, textbooks, for classroom libraries, found out that a lot of classrooms did not have a classroom library. Um, and so we focused our purchasing on the gaps that existed. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have Jean talk a little bit about the technology piece, and then I'll come back with some information about textbooks, and also <coughs> she'll address some other things, so if you. Um, gosh, I can't tell you, I've taught in this district for 22 years, and I can't think of a more exciting time to be a language arts teacher. Um, I don't know if any of you are around 10, oh, well, I know some of you are around 10 years ago, but 10 years ago, um, a group of us from the middle <coughs> school went to Chilton, and they were um, viewed statewide as having an exemplary, exemplary reading program, and their test scores were just out of this world. And we came back with a list of recommendations that we actually came to present to the board. And today, thanks to uh, the allocations that we were provided and some really strong leadership, um, those recommendations that we made then are really coming to fruition, and it is, it, it's completely empowering as an educator. Um, first of all, starting with the scheduling, allowing uh, us to have an hour of reading along with language arts at all of our grade levels at the middle level, I think will make an um, um, amazing impact on our learning community. And I think in looking at the test scores, it already has begun to make a tremendous impact. Um, so with these allocations, one of the things that we were able to do is to purchase a, a, a book called The Writing Coach. And it's a textbook for teaching writing. And we now have, for the first time since I've been here, a unified approach, six through eight, to teach writing. It's all geared toward Common Core standards. It addresses um, writing using best practices, along with a grammar component that's heavily represented in Common Core Standards. It provides us with a tool to send students with a unified set of skills onto the high school for the next part of their educational journey. So that is really exciting. Um, along with that, we have document cameras for the language arts teachers. Um, one of the best practices in writing instru instruction is modeling. And one of the things, one of the many things that those document cameras allow us to do is to model writing in our classrooms with our students and to eat seamlessly take a piece of student writing and use that as examples and um, I have the good fortune of having one in my classroom now it has made me a better teacher of writing in the one year that I've had it than in all the years combined just because I'm so easily and readily able to show students revision strategies 
um, editing strategies without there being any time lapse. Um, we also have access now to technology. We are really moving toward a reading writing workshop approach and having laptops, Chromebooks specifically available to us in our, in our classrooms um, allows us to use the, the Google apps and the cloud-based approach where students can be working on a project at school, go home, access their Google accounts, continue to work on that document there and it really prepares them not just to be writers, but to be writers in the 21st century where they're accessing these cloud-based applications. Um, and finally, I think what's most exciting to me is the lit circle opportunities that we have, the, simply the books that we've purchased. The one, um, you know, over and over again, you'll see statistics that say that a student's being able to read well is like one of the single most important factor in their success as a student in all content areas. And we have kids reading like never before because we've been able to purchase textbooks that are, or reading books rather, that are high quality, high interest. And uh, I've had so many teachers yell at me saying, McMahon, I can't get my kids to stop reading in math class. Would you, you know, stop giving them these good books? And that's, you know, for me, like, it's great. You know, I'll let them, that's a battle I'm willing to let them take on. But it's, it's really, really, really exciting. So thank you so much for um, however the process came about that we were allocated that money. I think it's going to uh, be very empowering for educators and students. Can we have some questions here? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, Particularly when you started talking about your students reading in math class, um, <laughs> and we talk about Common Core, uh, it is yeah, it's obviously about reading. It's writing. It's about writing, but it's also about science and math, social studies. What are we doing in our literacy groups uh, to emphasize those type of skills where they're getting those college and career readiness skills of? Of being able to read the science textbooks, the math textbooks, uh, the social studies textbooks. You know, I think that that's the next piece in this puzzle, and I think that um, you know, language arts teachers, by nature, that's what our focus is on: is reading and writing. And I think that in the middle school, I think we have a really strong foundation of content area teachers who really understand that literacy looks different in different classrooms. Mm -hmm. For example, in social studies, when you're reading a text, you have to explain to your kids the nature of like cause and effect, because sure. so much in history is cause and effect related. It's different than interpreting a poem in language arts class or reading a science article in science. And so the fact that math is read differently than science is read differently than social studies in English, it means simply that we need to continue, I think, in my, and other people can answer this, but we really need to continue to give our content area teachers opportunities to um, get professional development in, in literacy in those content areas okay. and what it means to be a teacher. Because, I, you know, there, there, it's a little bit of a shift, you know, where a social studies teacher or a science teacher or a math teacher might say, well, I'm not a teacher of writing. But in those fields and in those contents, there is writing. It just looks different in each content. And to teach science well, you need to be able to read science well and write science well. And just so I think that is a professional development piece sure. that has already been started, but that probably we need to continue. Okay. Okay. Did that answer it? Yes, yeah, so we're working on it. <laughs> okay, okay. It's important. There you go. It's very right. important. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> address that question we are working on um, a lot of our purchases have been nonfiction text and working on integrating nonfiction reading strategies into all the content areas we also have included all the content areas um, representing on our literacy committee Good. and all of them have um, had the opportunity to order classroom libraries to support their content area so it is a work in progress but we are addressing the content area literacy and that's one of our um, big goals so right. um, it's we're, we're working on it. Super. Good. Um, I'd like to point out the sixth grade language arts teachers have decided to um, go with a literature series because they felt they didn't have enough coherence and consistency. Um, they've selected 
Holt McDougall literature, and it's Common Core aligned. And it's, it's a wonderful series. They are actually already using it. It came in right before spring break, and um, they had to have their hands on it immediately. So I got it to them. They're using it, and I asked for some feedback um, on last week, and they said they love it. And it's addressing um, the higher rigor expected with the Common Core and getting students involved in those higher level discussions and higher level thinking. So they're really excited about it. Um, there's an online component, uh, 21st century learning is addressed, as is in the writing coach. There's 21st century learning skills and writing integrated into that textbook series as well. So I'm pretty, pretty excited about these new purchases in terms of textbooks because they're really not, you know, I know they, Basils and literature series have gotten a bad reputation over the years, but they really ramped up these new texts, and this is just, I think it's going to work out really well for them. And I think Michelle said a couple of really important things that I want to make sure we reiterate is the fact that the adults are excited about what they're teaching, and how will kids be excited about what they're teaching and learning if, if, if the adults are not excited? And we have adults in our building right now who are just jacked up beyond mm -hmm. belief about what they're doing in their classrooms, and that trickles down to how kids feel about being in that classroom. Could you, could you explain the, you said the sixth grade language arts teachers wanted to be more consistent and coherent? Were yeah. those the two words? Yes, or with the curriculum that they're teaching, yes. They felt like they, they needed um, a source like that, Was that to meet the common meaning? core standards. All, all the sixth grade language arts teachers will be using that. Some are already using it right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, other purchases that we've made, um, some professional development materials. We're focusing on vocabulary instruction, comprehension strategies, writing instruction, and continuity literacy. So those are the focus areas in which we've made purchases for professional resource books for teachers. And we are planning professional development activities um, for this year actually with a book study with a book Write Like This by Kelly Gallagher who is um, a teacher in California who does um, speaking and he has written books. He's a very um, top-notch resource for us so we're going to be having a book study before the end of the year and then moving into next year we'll have cohorts for professional development in um, the areas I just mentioned, vocab, comprehension, writing, continuity literacy. Um, intervention materials is something that was really needed. Um, teachers have been kind of grasping for resources for intervention time because at the middle school we have the tiered intervention time and um, we have reading skills groups. So we needed to look at getting materials to support those intervention times which are at the end of the day, very short time period, and to um, have a set of materials that will work. What I have, um, one of the things I brought to show you is called Bold Print, and it's a resource for reading, teaching reading strategies for struggling readers, and it is fantastic. Um, I used it already with a group of eighth grade students, and I will pass it around, but I had it up on the podium, and they were crowding around it, and opening the book and looking at it, and on the back page they list all the different books uh, in the series, and they're like, I want to read that one, I want to read that one. And it was just really exciting because I'm like, wow, they're excited about this, this reading. And it's mostly not a lot of nonfiction, as well as some fiction pieces, just a nice variety of genres represented. And I'll just pass one of those around to you right now. Um, I think I've addressed the, the integration of resources. We're working on having literacy cohorts in the fall, having our book studies in the fall with focus, and um, also with the all the different areas we're going to work on next year. So we're really excited about it, and I think it's it's going to be a great great improvement to our curriculum meeting our learning targets. Thank you, guys. Next, uh, we want to share about our science progress, and tonight Jen Beth is here from the high school. She's very excited to be here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just sitting in the carpet chair meeting. <laughs> oh, shoot, I have a board meeting tonight. Um, hello, I'm Jen Beth. I've been here for, this will be my 14th year already. I'll have to I have to apologize. I'm uh, kind of combating a cold that's running through our house right now. <coughs> so if I start coughing, I excuse myself. 
Um, one thing that we decided to do when we got together this last summer, it started actually kind of in the summer, we got the elementary level teachers together and we went through scope and sequence from kindergarten through fifth grade. We kind of decided what they were going to hit on mainly each year and, or yeah, what they were going to do in each level from year to year. So that way we kind of knew what the middle school should be doing and then what the high school should be doing. So it started last summer. That fit into this year, us sitting down, making our ELTs, um, essential learning targets for middle school and high school. And we kind of determined then where gaps were, what we needed to do to kind of stay com um, compatible, competitive, It's another word, with other districts. So we decided overall to move biology down to the ninth grade level, which then meant that physical science kind of got dispersed in amongst the middle school levels. So grades six, seven, and eight are all going to be doing a little bit of physical science. I'm not so sure about seventh grade. I think Karen's kind of got a hold on that one. But sixth and eighth are going to kind of absorb a little bit of that middle school or that physical science level that we taught at ninth grade. Um, so freshmen are going to now be taking biology as of next year. So that means we're going to have 550 students in biology next year. So a lot of the monies that were allocated towards the high school level went towards materials to supplement the biology. So we did get new texts and we got them in. And these are what they look like. They're very large. But they're new. They have a lot of um, supporting materials that we didn't have with our old texts. One of them being standardized test prep kind of questions and things that um, just newer textbooks. I mean, our textbooks were, I think, copyrighted 2000. So that, I mean, science changes somewhat, but especially biology changes more than anything, really, with genetics and whatnot and genetic engineering. So we got new biology textbooks. We got new microscopes. So we're going to be dispersing some of the microscopes from the high school down. And um, Scott lotzi has got a line on some fifth grade teachers that are very excited to get some microscopes. So we're going to be doing that for a lot of bio stuff. The middle school is getting Chromebooks to add to the technology thing. And um, they're also getting a bunch of models to help with what they teach. And then we really mostly got bio stuff, scopes, balances, um, an incubator, a lab oven, all sorts of dissection equipment, all sorts of critters in jars, <laughs> all sorts of fun stuff. <laughs> we, well, we needed some more of this stuff. We need, yeah, after going through and cleaning out Mike Widener's classroom, we needed some new stuff because <laughs> Mike was here for a long time. Um, so I guess that's our big thing is we're just kind of moving everything down, increasing the rigor. So ninth grade will be bio, 10th grade will be chem. 11th grade will be physics, and then that opens up electives. We're going to plan on hopefully adding a nurse science course. We've got AP Bio starting next year. We've got um, tentative plans for AP Chem in the coming years. Um, Scott's doing some AP Physics, so we're getting some advanced placement courses, finally at the high school level, too, which is exciting. Thank you, Jen. What's the timetable <laughs> on AP Chem, the plan? Probably two more years. Two more years? Is that a matter of, of textbooks, training, facilities, or? Bubble years. We kind of got to work through the bubbles a little bit. Working with the students' needs. Working with yeah. what we've got. Because we'll have 500 kids in bio next year. Okay. And then that following year, we should have a bubble of kids going through chem. Okay. And then the, I mean, we have enough chem teachers to cover it. The problem is, is you need chem before you can take AP chem. It's sure. not an either or, it's a subsequent course. Okay. So. All right, I'm getting on a separate subject that maybe Bill can answer this. Do we have the facilities if we start ramping up in some of these areas to handle that in our lab? As of right now, yes. As of right now, okay. But if we were to get unanticipated, and I would hope maybe this might even happen, we get a lot of people more there's, there's a possibility that we could bump again, up against what we have. We could, but I think it's important to understand that right now we're, we're in a situation where everybody has their own classroom. Sure. And there are other opportunities that might exist if necessary where classrooms might need to be shared periodic times throughout the course. And you have to take a look at where we're offering classes right now mm -hmm. and make some adjustments.
because we have to make some accommodations for chemistry because there's specific rooms that can can use that particular class and other classes which would be less conducive for that based upon being built facilities and things of that nature. Okay. Um, you're obviously you're working on the team that's did the, a lot of the standards for the, all the way through. Yeah, um, yeah, because I did the summer work last summer. Is it that we're so, really ramping up our elementary schools in a lot of ways, or streamlining? Streamlining. Streamlining, because it's not if we what we were trying to do is we were trying to organize so that way every student had at least the same core experience. They could add to it, but they couldn't take away from it. Okay. So that way, every student in kindergarten learned about rocks, sun, and bugs. Cool. Every kid in first grade learned about these three things. Because we know that they're taking time away to do literacy and reading and math, and I get that. So we want to make sure that they're at least getting that core experience at the elementary, and then individual elementary teachers can add to it if they wish to. Okay. All right. That's what we're, our desire was to be. And then we're obviously then shifting some stuff around in the middle school. A little bit, yeah. To so they accommodate the fact that maybe we're going to have everybody running in and yeah. ramping into biology. Maybe. Yeah, we came to find out that they were te they were teaching a little bit of phi site at the sixth and eighth grade levels already. Okay. So now they're just doing a little bit more. Okay. So, right. And fifth grade was too. Mm -hmm. Fifth grade was covering a lot of phi sci. Cool. Good. Thank you. So, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, we have social studies. And tonight, Tessa Fagg is here, so fifth grade teacher. Nancy, Nancy Miller, who is at the middle school, and Barry Flesh is at the high school. And we did some significant changes to our scope and sequence in terms of social studies. Yeah, let's start elementary first. That'd be great. Okay. Hello, my name is Tessa Fagg, and I teach fifth grade at um, Bearman Elementary. Um, so anyways, we were excited to know from fifth grade that we were also part of the whole um, funding through our elementary level. And the biggest thing for us is we've got a lot of young fifth grade teachers now when we were teaching out of this book, which was published when I was in eighth grade. <laughs> so I just, you know, I'm now one of the younger teachers. <laughs> okay, we're going to get some material that's more um, um, more current for the students because obviously things are changing. When I think current in here is the 60s and 70s, which none of us were born yet, so we were teaching those kind of things. Um, you, you just need to turn and see the level of disgust. <laughs> The true history. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing current that they could really relate to. Is there, is there anything beyond the 60s? <laughs> 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 That's why we have all this technology. <laughs> so we were excited to um, purchase some new things. And we decided um, as a fifth grade team that textbooks for us we're not the way to go because knowing just going through college, being in school recently, that a lot of times you're not using textbooks anymore. You're using the internet. You're using different sources. So we decided in fifth grade this wasn't a way that would give the best learning for students. Also, we're really in, um, we teach a lot of literacy. That is, our day is focused math and literacy. And how can we integrate our science and social studies and um, into our literacy and math and our writing? So we decided to go with the National Geographic route, which was awesome. Basically, it is a textbook, but they're broken down into smaller books. So this would be like a unit in a textbook. It's broken down into these sections, and it has lots of pictures, which is engaging for fifth graders. Fifth graders don't want to look at two pages full of writing or two columns of writing, a small picture, two columns of writing. That's not engaging for them. I mean, we're really, to be honest, we're up against their video games, we're up against their 
um, laptops, iPads, all those things that they're really interested in. So we needed to find something that we can do that's going to engage them and they're going to want to read and do. So we decided on these books and I brought a whole bunch of them and what was great about the National Geographics are there's two sets, two levels. So this one is Kids Manage Money and then there's going to be a larger one also, Money and You. Two books teaching this exact same concept. This one's written, and they're all different, so the smaller ones are written at a fifth or sixth grade level, anywhere between there. The larger books are written at uh, between a third and fourth grade level. So we all know we have students that read at different levels. So now you have text they can actually read. They can read together, they can read with you, they can read on their own. So really if you go from the third through sixth grade level, you're hitting most of the students you have in your class with the same basic concepts. So we thought this was a really good um, way to spend our money. And what we decided, um, like they did for science, we went through and each grade level said, okay, this is what we're going to teach, make sure we hit those core concepts. Uh, we have to teach in fifth grade U.S. history as well as U.S. regions, so we had to buy two kits. We have one kit on the history, and it goes from pre-revolutionary war all the way up to now, saving money as part of you know what you're talking about, and this is one of the last ones in the series. Talking about community, um, talking about freedom, not only like freedom of the Civil War, but freedoms along the way that we've had to um, try to deal with and work um, through in our history. And then the last thing which we're gonna teach in the last trimester is we've got um, different books on the regions of the United States. So we also need to teach that to our students. So once they learn the history, how did we become a nation, now we learn um, what is our nation made up of, the different um, physical features, different um, communities, cultures, everything <coughs> that makes up our country. So in a nutshell, that's what we're going to be learning about in fifth grade. What we're excited about is everybody had this textbook. We were all teaching out of it. There's no way in fifth grade, you can teach this entire textbook. I mean, I could show you a few, you know, you can kind of take a look in here. That's a lot of writing, a little bit of pictures, not much that you can get through because we do focus so much on literacy. Um, with these books, you could do a social studies lesson, you could do a literacy lesson. Then you can turn around and create book clubs where the kids are reading historical fiction <coughs> books on, let's say, specifically, uh, let's see. Colonial Life, probably one of the first books you'll teach. So now you can find a book of historical fiction, maybe on Jamestown or some of the settlers, maybe a Sacagawea book, something like that. So the kids are reading that, discussing it, and that's now your language arts. So you're infusing your language arts with your social studies, and it's kind of becoming one thing now. They don't know, are you teaching social studies or language arts? Because you're doing it all at the same time. And the best part of it is when they can say, hey, I'm making a connection to this book because of something that I read in my social studies book, and then you know there's true understanding. So we're really excited to try to weave it all together, and that's one of the things that fifth grade teachers want to do over the summer is come together and say, all right, now what books in our book rooms do we have for book clubs? I've taught this book club, here's all my information, so you know, we're, not, we're sharing, we're not reinventing the wheel on it all, and we're really excited to do that. Another thing we want to incorporate, which didn't come with this, but we want to start to work on is adding some of that technology. How can we get the kids interested in researching, using those iPads that we have or laptops and now becoming <coughs> um, investigators, not just you know sucking all the information up but finding it themselves. So that's what we're trying to do. We're working towards it. We just got this material um, a week and a half or two weeks ago, so we're just taking the time to look through it and figure out what we can do with it from here. So. Thank you. If, you. if you want, you can look at it, or I can just put it back to my head. <laughs> <laughs> Take a peek at what we're going to be using. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Is it the old folks' turn now? It's <laughs> what decade are we going to talk about here? <laughs> here comes the nostalgia. The oldies are up. All right, we're good. Um, when we got to get, um, I'm Nancy Miller, and um, I teach eighth grade social studies. <laughs> And when we got together this fall, um, 5 through 12, we not only had to talk about essential learning targets and getting those arranged, but we also had to decide how to spend the money that you had graciously given us for allocation for social studies. 
And in looking at the essential learning targets and at looking at our scope and sequence, we were bothered by the fact, and we have talked about this previously too, at the middle school level, there's not U.S. history. And we thought that that was a real weakness, that U.S. history is taught in fifth grade to some extent, and then they have to wait till 11th grade um, in order for their U.S. history course in high school. And we thought that was just too long of a time period. And in looking at our middle school curriculum, we have geography at the sixth grade, we have geography at the eighth grade, not necessarily the same thing. In sixth grade, they concentrate on Latin America, they concentrate on Canada. In world geography at eighth grade, we concentrate on other regions of the world. But we found that there was a lot of overlap in talking about the five themes of geography, in talking about cultural and physical aspects. So we decided that we wanted to change our scope and sequence. And we would want to put a US history course in at eighth grade. And looking at the WKCE testing, looking at other school districts, we felt that there was just a real need to provide US history at the middle school level. And in terms of US history at the high school, um, as the years go on, obviously, you get more and more history that you have to teach. <laughs> And I think, and Barry will attest to that, it was becoming harder and harder to get everything in from the age of exploration all the way up to 2012. So what we have decided to do is to kind of divide that up and have our U.S. history course at the eighth grade level go from age of exploration through the, the Civil War and really take an in-depth look at that time period. And then the 11th grade U.S. history would then be from the aftermath of the Civil War through the present time. And I don't know if you want to oh, that speak to that. Out very well. oh. It allows us an opportunity to get closer to today. You know, historically, we barely made it to the Vietnam War. And now it becomes much more relevant to the students. You know, we can get as close to you know, their world as we can. It's, it's that much better. Yep. The resources that we're looking at at the middle school, um, both at the sixth grade and the eighth grade levels, are what we call Geography Alive and, and History Alive. And um, it's a wonderful approach. We've had um, representatives from the company that makes these texts and these materials um, up to see us a couple of times. And I have talked to numerous teachers from other districts. And actually, I was talking to them a couple weeks ago at our at our conference down in Madison. And it's a very highly regarded curriculum. Um, not only do they give us a textbook to provide the foundation for the history, but they give us student resources. We've been talking about reading and writing in social studies. And they give us wonderful resources, um, graphic organizers for taking notes, um, other reading and writing strategies that we can use with the kids. They provide us with internet sources. Um, they're very big on primary sources. And that's very important when you're talking US history. It could be letters that um, soldiers sent home through the Civil War, looking at those letters, getting some idea of what life was like and what that experience was like for them. It could be Benjamin Franklin's take on the Constitutional Convention. Um, but primary sources are huge. And they provide us with wonderful internet ma materials um, to look at. And so we're very excited. Um, I'm excited because I'll be teaching this U.S. history course. And um, that time period is particularly my passion. So we're very excited about putting the U.S. history course in at the middle school level. The geography course will incorporate um, aspects of the sixth grade and the eighth grade. The seventh grade will retain um, our civics course that we have right now. Uh, that Paul Kuyaf and Kyle Jones teach. And I was talking with John actually today about a workshop that will be going to in August down in Madison um, that will provide us with additional training on putting more reading and writing into social studies. In addition, I was on the literacy committee and um, the books that they purchased, we were able to get some historical fiction books, some nonfiction books pertaining to history, pertaining to civics and government. So our classroom libraries will also be um, quite improved for next year. So 
We're anxious for all the changes. Oh, Good evening, Barry Josh, uh, social studies teacher at the high school department chair. And I'd just like to start by thanking you. It's been really nice to see an investment in social studies. And I know speaking for everybody in the group, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to do this. It's, it, it has been a long time coming and we're very thankful for it. And I think Nancy highlighted the changes we're doing at the high school with US history. And it's, it's exciting to see all the changes underneath us and, and we we'll reap those benefits, benefits at the high school greatly. Uh, we're gonna be able to, at the high school, get a bunch of new textbooks for the various courses. Um, biggest things will be, uh, like in civics, you talked about uh, the 80s there, our presidents uh, were Bill Clinton in, in our books. So <laughs> we we're already on to two more presidents from him. So it's gonna be nice to get some updated materials and some uh, all the bells and whistles that come with these new purchases. So we're very excited. And at a freshman level, they're gonna get new textbooks as well in econ and in uh, area studies. And then down the road, we hope to, in uh, U.S. history, when the eighth graders next year get up here, we'll be able to make some adjustments in a few years, hopefully. So I'm planning a seat here that we might need some U.S. history. <laughs> <laughs> We're also getting a classroom set of Chromebooks, and I think Matt Pallon's going to be talking about that in a minute. We did you at the middle school. Uh, so it's really exciting in that respect, too, to get some technology in it. I just would like to compliment the process. It was a very good process that we went through and it was very well done and uh, it was exciting. And I think the changes will, uh, will be shown to the kids and that's really what we're here for, the students, and I think that'll be great. So, and I do you. wanna, I'm sorry, I do wanna commend Lori too. Um, she has been wonderful to work with and has provided guidance, has provided leadership, and as Barry said, it, it's been a very fruitful and very productive process. It was like Christmas. I got a, I got a question about the, the presents that we, that we gave. Uh, <laughs> obviously, we're, t we're we're still talking in our in our book about Bill Clinton, and obviously, there's a lot of history that's still even occurred since then. And, and and now that we're looking at the new materials, and and we have obviously there are other things that we could do. Are we going to be able to do things so like? four years, six years, whatever down the line, I'm still not talking just about Barack Obama, but whoever the next president is going to end up being. I think so. I think these Chromebooks will all have smart boards next year. Um, and again, textbooks are just one tool, a part of the puzzle. And, you know, we don't rely on textbooks as heavily as we used to, so, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's, a, it's a good basis sure. for what you're talking about. Um, we have junior scholastic magazines. We talk about current events a lot. Um, so there are a lot of materials up there that we can use to update materials that might become a tad outdated with the textbooks that we have. Okay, and, and I know I asked this, and maybe I, 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 they call me Mr. Redundant sometimes, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, but when we're talking about college and career readiness, and you know, I talked it with the literacy teachers, and I'm talking to the, the leaders of our social studies department. <laughs> Are you implementing things so that you know these skills are going to translate? And I'm not just looking for better test scores, but mm -hmm. kids that are going to be more ready for college, uh, more ready in other areas of life too. Well, I think some of the skills that are important in terms of social studies classrooms are critical thinking skills mm -hmm. and being able to look at issues, being able to look at problems objectively. You know, here are the two sides. You know, let's take a look at what this issue is. And sure. so I think. Critical thinking skills are very important no matter what level you are in social studies. And I think that's something that we really do stress. I know at high school, myself personally, I started at Jackie and Mont come in and try to work with social studies language. and Because mm -hmm. it is yeah. really hard for kids to understand social studies. Sure. And um, mm -hmm. you know, we do need help with literacy and that. So. She's a tremendous help with middle school, too. Okay. Good. Thank you. I just wanted to say again, thank you, and it was a pleasure to hear them talk, because I was living through the year as I was listening to them talk, and Erin said, did you ask them to say those things, and I didn't necessarily, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm really proud of their work and their excitement and hearing their voices tonight, I think, rings true, like John said. They're excited about what they're doing in their classrooms, and that's going to have an impact on our students and their achievement, so thank you. But we felt it was important, too, to come back to the board after you made that commitment of resources to really make that connection again to student learning and the changes that are taking place. And, and I want to uh, commend the teachers who are here tonight 
giving of their time to present this information and you know we it's not an easy process to go through and you hit a few bumps in the roads and sometimes you end up at a place where you didn't think you were going to be at the onset of the process but um, I think too Lori did an excellent job working with the teachers and the leaders in the buildings to come up with some really good decisions that are going to benefit our kids in the future. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Thank yes, you very thank much. Thank you everybody. Good. Up next we have Mr. Pelland um, at the request of some board meetings of the past to show us some of the technology resources and a little bit of actual usage of those items. So <coughs> I'm really going to talk specifically, I'm going to pull up a little, I shared a presentation with you, but what I kind of, it's kind of interesting listening to all the conversation that goes on, it's really exciting actually to see, because we're really trying to find the right tool to meet the need. You know what I'm saying? And if you think of like this, like nailed it, you know, like with your students, it's like the optimal tool that really meets that specific need. But really, and the, and the Chromebook, is another specific tool that meets a specific need. But uh, an iPad or a new laptop now, that this tiny now, a new Mac, or this kind of device or a desktop, we're just trying to find the best tool um, to meet the need that we specifically have. <coughs> when the whole process started with the, the whole gang here, I had an opportunity to sit down meet with each of them and talk about what a Chromebook is even, what it does, how it works, because it's not, it's not your typical laptop computer. Um, but ultimately what it did for us is it provided an access to uh, what their need is at a pretty reasonable cost. And uh, so what I'd like to do today, I'll get to pull this up real quick, is to talk specifically about the Chromebook. Or maybe I'll just go through it because you have the presentation if you have an iPad, right? Um, you could pull that up, but um, maybe for people out here, I'll pull it up here real quick. But yeah, finding the right tool, it's always exciting just to hear those stories because it is time to celebrate and talk about that because a lot of times we do learn work like that um, and get it in place and we don't hear how it's all working. So it's really cool to hear that stuff and it's exciting. Um, now, it's so, oh numbers. Do you want to talk about numbers? Is that what you wanted to talk about? And well, I just want to be the demo part of it. Sure. So. I just wanted to add that with the purchasing that we did for middle school literacy and science and social studies, a certain portion of those dollars went to purchasing technology too, because of what you were just talking about relevancy and keeping up to date. And so we recognize that we can't just spend money on paper materials. That we need to have a hybrid approach and purchase some technology. So we know we're not ready to have all of our instruction on devices. But we know that that's the future, so we were purposeful in looking at those devices that will allow us to stay current with our materials. Awesome. Um, it's interesting because they talk about like how do you use these devices, and it was kind of crazy because you see a textbook, big, big textbook, right, and you start thinking like, well, that's outdated, like, if you have it, okay, even the brand new ones, because suddenly if you're a new president, they're not going to be in there. But the deal is, is a lot of these resources come with extra resources that are all web-based now. So having the resources in the classroom to use is going to really be a benefit because those resources will be updated, not necessarily the books. So um, when I met with the sixth grade at the middle school, that's what we talked about. Like, how do I get access to these things? How do I, how do I keep my kids logged in? So that's another whole process. But ultimately, now there's a, a whole set of online. This is the book, right? This, there's a whole set of online resources that come with this book where the kids can access it at school on these devices or at home. So it's really pretty rich. So I'm going to pull this up real quick, talk real quick about the Chromebook specifically. Kind of the benefits, because there's been some questions in regards to, um, well, we just get Chromebooks for everybody, you know? And really it's hard to, to even, because they are rather, um, they're affordable, and they're, they're, they are um, a good resource. But this is what we did with the literacy. This is what happened here with the purchase. We added 160 devices um, to the middle school. Um, five carts of Chromebooks. See how it's broken out by literacy or science or social studies. And we had some MacBooks for language arts also. And then 30 Chromebooks at the high school. And it's awesome. 
190 resources that are put in the hands of those uh, specific students pretty quickly. So we're pretty happy to see that um, that process kind of go through. And there are many applications. Just talking about specific applications of the Chromebook, there, people always talk about research, and I was talking to Nancy, she's already done a lot of collaboration with Google Docs, cloud computing. If you're using that specific framework that the Chromebook um, is good at, it works really, really well. And it provides a great tool to be able to collaborate, to be able to communicate, to be able to create um, with this specific device at a reasonable cost. These are the kinds of things you can do. Just talking about, you know, researching, resource sharing. You know, and we're still at a time, it's interesting talking to teachers, they're so used to using like local resources to share. And I'm like, hey, make a Google Doc share with your kids. You know? Oh, didn't even think about that, you know? So now, again, there's a lot of professional development that comes with this um, to help them understand how to use these resources effectively with their students in a class. And it's not like just drop them in place then off you go and hope they figure it out. That's not the point. We're going to continually provide professional development for them to be able to use a Chromebook or a MacBook or an iPod, whatever it may be, well in their classroom. And just again, one size doesn't fit at all. It really doesn't. Because that specific app that's on there is rich. And there's, there's millions of apps for the, I, for the iPod and iPad that are in the education store, they're not available for like a Chromebook, okay? And they're not touch screen. So there's a lot of different things that kind of go in place. But the Chromebook. So I want to talk specifically about, and this is kind of an, I, I encourage you to ask any questions you'd like regarding this whole thing, because yes, they're affordable, they really are. Um, but they're certainly not a Mac, all right? They're not a desktop computer. They don't do the same kinds of things. Um, but they certainly are meeting a need in a broad way right now in schools in general. But a Chromebook um, is great. Is one, one wonderful thing about a Chromebook is it's got eight hours of battery life. We've struggled for ever trying to make it through a day. You would imagine um, what it would look like if you had a cart from four years ago. Suddenly all the cables are all pulled out of the back. They're plugging it in the walls wherever they're at in their classroom. Well, that's not transparency very well because it gets two or three hours of battery life. And now a device like that gives us the flexibility for an entire day of use. Um, so it's really nice, it's small, it's pared down. It's basically built on a browser, a web browser only. There's no applications on it but Chrome, a web browser only. So there's no, there's no additional software needed. It's mobile, portable. And the login times is eight seconds, okay? And if you ask teachers now, it's like, well, turn it on. And especially with Windows, especially at the middle school and high school, you're talking four or five minutes by the time they get logged in. Well, that's not real good time on task, okay? Um, so this resource is quick. You turn it on, you open it up, you're logging in, and you're able to use that resource pretty much instantaneously, which is powerful. Um, and again, it works with Google Docs, which, is a, which the district has put as being our foundation of collaboration and communication within our school district. So it's a great tool um, because it works very seamlessly with it. And the cost is obviously a nice cost. But over in people up there, there's still $60 per Chromebook per year on top of that for us to manage that device. And that hopefully is going to go down that cost. Um, but ultimately, the one shot deal here. It looks good right there, but we still have to pay a certain amount of money to manage it. If we want to manage it, we wouldn't have, which management means make it so that it's safe for kids and things like that in our environment. Um, now, obviously, you can do a lot of communication, collaboration, creation, research, and we can get those things out quickly. Mm -hmm. and we've already, I think, put out 120 of them, which is awesome. And Corey Griffin, obviously, has helped tremendously the last hire to really help get that stuff out get that stuff out in a quick way to our staff so they can start using them. So these are the benefits of a Chromebook. <coughs> and obviously a Chromebook does it do this. Rich multimedia creation. 
okay, like iMovie or GarageBand. Obviously, you need something with more horsepower, higher processing, things like that. Um, it doesn't utilize Microsoft Office, so the business ad who, whose framework is using Microsoft Office can't use something like that in their specific area. It doesn't make sense for them. Or either with Tech Ed, then you have CAD, you can't run CAD on this. This is a, a low processing, great battery life, doesn't need a whole lot of resources to run itself. A uh, book, you certainly need something bigger, beefier, with a bigger screen, because you're gonna be working now on CAD. A little bit more workspace, okay? And another, another hang up we have is map testing won't work over wireless. So a lot of our areas, like our elementary schools or middle school, their labs, uh, we need a static plugged in machine in order to take tests. So we're kind of stuck in specific areas for that. And I think WKC testing, you were telling me about it, is going to need a static workstation also. Um, Matt, with all the wireless devices that we're adding, and especially with the Chromebook that uses just a web browser, what does that do for our infrastructure needs and our wireless, and our, you know, our access points? Do we how are we set for that? Are we able to handle right. the growth in that area? It's a good question. Or is there an over investment? Over Christmas, we added about $8,000 in wiring. We purchased some extra access points. We beefed up all those little beacons on the wall. We've added and we've updated to a newer um, version that allows us to connect now 50 instead of 25. So we have looked at heat maps to see where we're deficient in specific areas. And we've beefed it up. So we're ready. Like we're going to plop 300 of these devices on probably in the next two weeks, and we don't think it's we're going to blink an eye. We're going to be able to handle it, but we're ready. Does that make sense? So we're working on a plan always, continually, trying to figure out where we got to allocate our resources. And I think we've done a pretty decent job of doing that um, with, with, with the wireless because we know that's kind of with the direction that we're going. That makes sense. So anyway, that's just a, that's a Chromebook kind of flyover, and that's kind of what I came here to talk about, is again, one size doesn't quite fit all, it really doesn't, I wish it did, and at some point in time, this might be a great multimedia tool, like as far as video and uh, CAD or Adobe Photoshop, some of the other needs that we have, but right now, it has a specific niche that it fills, and I think it does it well, it really does, and a lot of schools have looked at a one-to-one -one opportunity to do something like this because it does fit such a nice niche. It's not a one-shop stop shop, but it certainly provides a nice niche at a nice price point. Anybody have any questions? Or You provided some YouTube videos I thought that were very good too. So I mean, yeah, and I sent that out as a resource. Another, yeah. another thing, you think about that, as I update and add more resources, that's a live document that I've shared with you. And now you, you'll get those newer videos or whatever. So yeah, they were good. I encourage you to take a look at them. It really helps you understand kind of how it all, it all works out. Yep. Thank you. Is, is there one version of the Chromebook? I mean, it's been out about a year, correct? Right. Is there just one version of it? Is there one bigger screen size? I mean, it's. No, this is it right now. Okay. There's, I think there's another model, isn't there? Acer's got a model, but we like this one just because it had. That's the one that Google's pushing out most. Yeah. So, but it but it, it updates by itself too. So there's newer versions of Chrome itself, but the hardware hasn't much hasn't changed much in the year. So. All of the technology investment um, is built around what has commonly now been called flipping the classroom, <coughs> which allows the teacher to become a facilitator through the technology and the textbooks to guide <coughs> children to discover the answers rather than feeding them answers. It is the process of discovery. And uh, there's nothing more exciting than trying to understand from a child's perspective a new piece of technology. I go to my seven-year-old to learn how to use this. They're great. But I mean, flipping the classroom is all about making the student and student achievement the center and building everything out of that. And that's what this investment is all about. <coughs> say, Matt, is your goal, let's say, in the next couple of years, because I know there's some schools that are already going to it, is your goal to someday have a laptop for every student? 
I think working with our 21st century uh, uh, team for the strategic planning team, I mean, that, that's something we've discussed. Right. I wouldn't say necessarily a laptop, but a device that would be at the developmental level of each of the kids. But for kindergartners, for example, an iPod is a very appropriate device. And just like Matt was saying, it's not a one-size-fits-all, depending on what the curriculum looks like at each grade level. A laptop might be more than what we need for each student to have a device. I can see the Chromebooks acting as a very appropriate device in a one-to-one. -one. I think with the amount of resources that we have currently and the integration of technology devices into our, our buildings, we're getting close with if we had our students bring their own device for those who have it, and we look at what we already currently provide, I bet you we'd be very close to a one-to-one. -one. And what we're talking about is developmental, as Correct. you say. You know, the appropriate tool for a kindergarten or elementary then prepares the way for a, a higher uh, tool uh, to be able to access the content and uh, the understanding. It's also 24-7. I mean, my daughter comes home and with guided instruction does her homework and moves forward using this technology. It's not just pulling out the textbook or, or the notebook, uh, the paper-based notebook. It's now you know, working through this technology uh, with her teacher and her class. The key to one-to-one -one is sustainability. You don't want to put devices in students' hands and then not be able to sustain that and take them away. Hey Matt, how close are we getting to, what are they calling it now, PYOD? Again, that's another, uh, it's another option, but it really plays a, um, it's not as easy to just bring your stuff to school. And I don't really don't, I have the, the, the problem I have with that whole thing is that I don't want it to be a convenience thing for kids. Like we're letting them bring them just to bring them. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have any impact instructionally in the classroom doesn't make a difference, you know? It's just like going to one-to-one, -one, okay? We don't want to put these in the stands of kids and it makes no instructional difference in the, in the, in the scheme of things at all. So really, um, as far as how close we are, I have no idea. The problem you run into is each device does its own thing differently, you know? And to really have impact in a classroom, it's difficult because you really want consistency. You know, if you want to have, it's going to be consistent classroom management, you're going to want to have a consistent tool. So a BYOD, I don't know. We've done a lot of research and I've seen a lot of people do it, but the most that I've seen it, generally it's more been on a convenience factor of allowing kids just to have access, who have access. So again, it's something that I, I, as far as how close we are, I really don't even know as far as how many students have specific devices. Does security become an issue in that, in that kind of environment? But the deal, for us too, we can separate that out entirely. Like we can like totally exclude it from our normal network and have them connect to a extraneous network that really doesn't even touch our physical network that uh, would have, have, any, have any security issues. Do you want to briefly talk about this family survey that you're sending out? The oh, it's just survey? gathering information, just a survey on access basically. Do you have um, uh, inter sufficient internet access at home? Do you have resources like mobile devices that would work in your, your students or your kids have those kinds of resources that you could bring to school before we even made a decision mm -hmm. to do a BYOD? Um, yeah, that's something we're kind of putting together and putting up, we're finalizing that to send that out hopefully in the next few weeks or so. so how, how do you plan on sending it out with campus? putting it through campus through people because most people um, have an email address somewhere logged into campus and we get quite a heavy usage at least primarily at the middle school and high school and even at the elementary grades we're planning on doing it. That probably be the best method to get the both results. Thanks Matt. Thank you. Thank you Matt. Brings us to the portion of the agenda entitled reports and first up is the legislative update and for that I will turn to Mr. Murray. Okay, I'll make this very, very brief. Um, it re you, Kevin received a letter uh, which he did forward to me from uh, Representative Clark. Uh, it's regarding the Save Our School proposal and in, in, in the proposal he talks about a uh, 7.4 percent increase in total aid 
uh, to the Baraboo School District from the state and the school levy credit and first dollar credit monies are big parts of that. Uh, I'll, I'll include that. Um, I think what will happen is, at least as far as the board, he'd like to have a meeting, but I think at least initially uh, the, the uh, legislative and policy committee will discuss it and maybe we'll figure out something either with the board or maybe even just with that committee that we could have a meeting uh, with Representative Clark or other people that are interested in that issue. Uh, the uh, second thing that I just want to talk about briefly is uh, recently with the school district, uh, Lori, uh, Crystal, myself, uh, have been having uh, a couple of meetings uh, with the Bearable Economic Development Corporation. Uh, they are ready to uh, do some more link linkages with the school district and uh, um, with the businesses. Uh, and then part of that linkage is with obviously I think we're going to have some uh, cooperation between city government, uh, obviously with our new mayor. Uh, Mike Palm is also the chairman of the Baraboo Economic Development Corporation. And, uh, and then many of the leaders of that group are also city councilmen. Uh, there are also people that are on county government that are part of that group. And so uh, looking forward to a lot of uh, close association with that group. And so uh, I know that this will be something that will be an ongoing thing and, and it will be part of our strategic plan too. So. Uh, there'll be more to report in the future on that. The last thing I want to report about, um, and that's just before Lori gives her report, is I had a call to action today from the National School Board Association regarding the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and they have in parentheses, also known as No Child Left Behind. That name will probably never go away. Uh, and they're talking about reauthorizing it, but it's, it is, again, like many things in legislation, has stalled in committee, uh, and they're looking for people to advocate to get that moving along. So I will do some advocacy for that, and hopefully we'll have a positive result uh, that we can hear about. And with that, that is my report. Okay. Thank you. Crystal, do you have anything to add as far as legislatively? No, I'll, I'll be meeting with um, the newly elected mayor and Pat Cannon next week to continue the discussion about the next steps for our business education partnership. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. As Doug alluded to, brings us to the next portion of the agenda under reports, the WKCE overview, and up again is Ms. Miller. I just want to note for you that um, I did send out this data to you at the time of the release. While we were reading about it in the paper, we got a notice from DPI saying that they did have an error on their reporting side. And you'll note that there are there are some changes in the data a little bit tonight, but it's just by 1% some of the areas, so it was a slight error. But I did want to note that for you to be uh, as upfront with our data as possible. Okay, so just real quick to create an understanding of the WKC, to remind you that it is a summative assessment that's intended to measure <coughs> attainment. It's a once a year snapshot of our student progress. And it is intended to measure the adequate yearly progress, or AYP, for as Doug was just mentioning, no child left behind reporting or accountability. And the benchmarks for the 2011-2012 school year has increased from last year. And so the benchmark for this year for reading is we wanted to aim for 87% of our students scoring proficient or advanced in, in area of reading and in terms of math, 79%. So that, those were our targets. And when you look at the data, it's reported based on full academic year, or FAY. We have more students in the Baraboo School District who took the test than we get the actual percentage for proficient or advanced because only those students that we instructed for a full year count in, counts in our data, if that makes sense. Um, so we do use this district to monitor strengths and weaknesses of the curriculum, and you heard uh, we've been responsive to some of the things that we've seen with our data with some of our curriculum work. And so this is the data that you received uh, a couple weeks ago. And again, I'll just note that in some, of, I think it's a handful of cells that was off by 1%. So it's not too significant, but I again, did want to note for you. And so just to, to share with you again that FAY, as an example, you know, in sixth grade, we have 256 students, but only 207 of our students are full academic year students. And so it's only those students 
that are represented in our percentages. And so with this chart, you will see that in the 23 components of the assessment, there's only a few places where our students didn't score at or above the state average. And the state averages are listed under each, underneath each area. Included in this data, I did share with you tonight the percentage of FAY students that are identified in each of the grades based on color, ELL, students with disabilities, and economic disadvantage. So in terms of students of color, you can see that here for each grade, the English language learners, which is anywhere from one to five percent at any grade level, are students with disabilities, and you can see that economic factor that we've talked about a number of times here as a board and how significant it is for our district. So I want to just share with you real quick one minute video clip from our Value Added Research Center in Madison about how do we look at the WKC from year to year. So if Glenn was taking the WKC as a, as a fifth grader, what he needs to do to succeed on the WKC the following year. It's a great demonstration. What follows is an abstract presentation of the changes in scale score ranges by grade and No Child Left Behind standards. We make the following assumptions for this abstraction. We will follow a single group of students from fourth grade to sixth grade. There is no student mobility, and student test scores are categorized into proficiency categories as determined by the WKCE cut scores. Here are the proficiency ranges and cut scores for students moving from 4th to 5th and 5th to 6th grade. The cut scores for each category are listed in the table at the top right. For example, for 4th grade students, a score ranging from 421 up to 437 falls into the basic category. Note that the size of these ranges varies greatly. The size of these ranges is not related to the number of students that fall into each range. It is simply the range of scores an individual student might have to fall into each category. First, we will look at this graphic from the standpoint of an individual. The black line indicates the cut score for fourth graders to be considered proficient, 438 scale score points. To maintain their proficient status as fifth graders, students must score 25 more points on the WKCE the following year and 22 scale score points more as sixth graders. Now let's take a look at this picture from the perspective of a school or district considering how to meet the requirements under NCLB of 100% advanced and proficient students. The black dots represent students scoring in one of the four proficiency categories. In fourth grade, 28.6% of students were scoring in the advanced range and 28.6% in the proficient range. As fifth graders, several students were able to improve their performance enough to cross into higher proficiency categories. In fifth grade, over 42% of students scored in the advanced range and over 20% scored in the proficient range. This picture illustrates the challenge of meeting the goal of NCLB as it is currently authorized and highlights the importance of monitoring student growth to make sure that not only are students maintaining their level of proficiency, but that more and more students each year are moving into the advanced and proficient categories. Okay. So I thought it was important to show, because I don't think even the general public has a good sense, or even some of our teachers have a sense, that you need to grow each year to maintain that proficient status. And when we move students from minimal or basic to proficiency, they actually have to grow more than a year's worth of time in order to close that gap, okay? So let's look at our reading achievement over the course of time. I thought it was important that we see how have we done as we look at, have we been able to move students to those different levels? So when you look at this chart, this is our, our grade levels by cohort. We only have one data point for our third graders because it's the first year that they've taken the assessment. And in order to read this chart in terms of reading, these fourth graders, this is where they scored last year's third graders. This is where they scored this year. Same kids, okay? So that's how you read this chart. In terms of fourth, 
And in terms of seventh grade, we've made huge gains with those students. Not only did the same students maintain proficiency, but we had a number of new students move up into that proficiency or advanced range. Does that make sense? Now, in terms of fifth grade, you can see we've had a dip. And in terms of sixth grade, we've had a dip. In terms of eighth grade, we've had a dip. And in tenth grade, we've stayed plateaued since they took their assessment in eighth grade. So it's the same students over time. If we look at the elementary schools, because we do have a four of them in the district, I wanted to be able to show you a visual of how they compare to each other in terms of reading achievement. And the last group of boxes there, on, or columns, shows our state in comparison. So the blue represents third grade, fourth represents, or sorry, red represents fourth grade, and yellow represents fifth grade. I also know that desegregated data is important to you all, and so I did include tonight the desegregated data that we have large enough cell sizes to share that data with you. And again, this is looking at students over time, but different students. So in this case, with students with disabilities, I'm sharing with you the last three years of their performance, but these are different third graders. Each bar represents a different group of students, okay? And when you look at how our students perform in terms of the state, the state is the last bar in each group, you can see that the yellow that represents Baraboo, we performed better than the state in all areas except for fifth grade and in sixth grade. But the other areas we did perform better as our students with disabilities. In terms of economically disadvantaged, Again, you can see that the last two bars represent um, Baraboo and the state. And in the case of all grade levels except for sixth grade, our students performed better, our economically disadvantaged students performed better than the state overall. So if we could draw some conclusions from that data. All grade level results except for 10th grade are below that proficiency benchmark of 87%. Remember, that's the proficiency benchmark for AYP. Baraboo 10th graders significantly outperformed their state peers with an 87% compared to 78%. So that's something to celebrate. Also, in terms of growth, even though they didn't meet the benchmark, the results for fourth and seventh grade indicate significant gains. If you think about that tutorial again from Value Added, the same students back in third grade, only 79% score proficient advanced, the same students now 85%. So those are good gains. In terms of seventh grade, 79 to 85% as well. Now the results for sixth and eighth grade indicate a dip in performance from last year. And so we want to look at the rest of our data. What other data do we have to see how are they doing monitoring their progress? And you may recall this was shared with you a little while ago after the winter assessment. We can see that, yep, back in the fall, remember when the students take the WKC, <coughs> it's in the same window here. And yet we know from our math data that our sixth graders were not performing like our norms are across the nation. They have been working to close the gap, but we have a ways to go. So what we're seeing on the WKC validates what we're seeing also with our math and vice versa. In terms of eighth grade though, you'll know that when our students take this or took the assessment in, in spring of last year, we know that they were a little bit above the norm and I bet over the summer they had a slide, but we measured them with the explore test. So we don't have that true fall benchmark to show you, but we now know in the winter that they're well above the norms. And so if they were to take that WKC today, I bet you you would see that they're at a higher level. <coughs> In terms of math achievement, again, now we're looking at the same group of students over time. You can see that at every grade level, except for eighth grade, which is plateaued, our students performed better than they did last year. So that's something to celebrate. Here is how our elementary schools look in comparison to each other and in comparison to the state. Here are our students with disabilities. And if we focus just on those last two bars again, you can see that our students, except for eighth and 10th grade, our students with disabilities outperform the state or their state peers. And in terms of economically disadvantaged, 
you can see that across the board, our students perform better <coughs> than their state peers who also have the same struggles. So to draw some conclusions, the results for grades 4th, 5th, and 10th are well above state average. Results for 4th through 7th grade indicate significant gains. Look at some of those gains in the same group of students. For 4th grade, 70 to 84 percent. That is significant. You don't see that in a lot of districts. Um, and, and you can see that for the other cases too. In 7th grade, 70 to 81 percent. All grade levels except third grade achieved at or above proficiency benchmarks, so that AYP benchmark. The third grade results are below the state average. So if we go back to our district data that we collect internally, we can see, yep, back in the fall, on the map, for math, our third graders were performing be below norms. But yet we also know with our internal data they've made a significant <coughs> increase in gains and they have closed that gap and they are now performing above the norms. And so when they do their spring assessment in a couple weeks, we'll be able to bring that data back to the board in the next month or so and see where did they end in spring. And then our efforts for summer school, I hope, in all of these cases will make a significant difference and we'll collect that data and monitor it as well. In terms of science achievement, uh, which again, our students are only assessed fourth, eighth, and tenth grade in science, so we can't monitor them over time like we can with the other, with the other areas. You can see over the past three years how our students have performed and in comparison to the state. Again, these are going to be different groups of students. It's not watching the same group of students over time. You can see that in terms of the state, um, you can see that in terms of the blue here, we performed better than the state. You can see that here in eighth grade, the state performed a little bit better than us in science. And then in terms of 10th grade, we did much better than the state average. So some conclusions. This year's students are performing significantly better than last year's students. I looked at their, their data from last year and at all three grade levels, Baraboo fourth and 10th graders performed well above their state peers. So following that same pattern, here's what language arts looks like for our fourth, eighth, and 10th graders. This year's students performed significantly, again, better than last year's students at all three grade levels. Our 10th graders performed well above their state peers. And if you measured their growth or watched their growth from the eighth grade to the 10th grade, they went from 69% proficient or advanced to 77%. So that, again, is pretty significant. And here's social studies. And we do have good attainment with social studies. Same situation, this year's students perform better than their last year's peers. All three grade levels perform better than the state, and the eighth and tenth grade were significantly <coughs> above their, their state peers. So I think that our data validates what we already know about what we need to do with student achievement. So areas for growth, reading and writing is our, our big area of focus. And I did this for, for you, some of the things that we've been working on. We've been working on explicit curriculum and learning principles, which I think has been a missing piece. There's been an investment in literacy coaches, which does a lot to guarantee instructional practices in the classroom, but we need to know where are we aiming with our students. And that's what we've been doing this year. And then also the addition of resources at the, at the middle school level. Also looking to increase our rigor and expectations with our Common Core State Standards and working on those essential learning targets. The coaching for balanced literacy and high quality instruction and also targeting higher benchmarks. We're looking at what are those benchmarks at each grade level that students need to achieve in terms of reading and writing to be college and career ready. And those are conversations I think that are relatively new in the district. We also know that we need to guarantee our curriculum across all content areas that consistency piece that you've heard earlier tonight, and making sure that our curriculum is viable, meaning that our students will indeed attain what we want them to know or be able to do. We also heard tonight about the, the focus on professional development, on literacy across all areas, all content areas. And then in terms of what we're doing with our RTI implementations, we need our staff to use real-time data to intervene as soon as possible. And also with RTI, we need to have high expectations for all of our students, or all of our students to achieve. So you heard a little student 
here tonight who's only been in our country for a few months, she's meeting our expectations, and those are the things we need to do for all of our students on a daily basis. So the celebrations, I think our math curriculum instruction is showing some good gains, and I attribute that to our instruction materials, our math coaches, explicit learning principles, and a focus on pacing. We also have made changes with our scope and sequence to increase rigor and relevancy in science and social studies. The work of our entire staff this school year on essential learning targets, so we have that guaranteed and viable curriculum. And I think, you know, sometimes when we look at data, especially when it's in the paper, we're like, wow, what can we do? We want to respond right away when we're not happy with something that we see with our data. And I want to say to you, we know exactly what we need to do. We just need to do it, and we have the resources to do it. We just need the time to do it. So I think that's something to celebrate, that we know what we need to do. The next steps, June 7th, we're going to be looking at this data much deeper with all of our staff uh, on that date of June 7th for our data retreats and setting some goals for our next school year. We shared with you our professional development plan moving forward for the next three years focused on the same, same themes, but that intervention team process will allow us to use real-time data the common assessments and rubrics to support our essential learning targets is next, and then the ongoing support focused on best practices from our coaches. Also, our supervision and evaluation process focuses on professional growth of our staff and delivering the curriculum at a level that has our students discovery, and also our <coughs> response intervention implementation as a school improvement model. I just want to highlight that for the 2012-13 WKCE, it will be, hopefully, the last year of the WKC if everything goes well. You also need to know that the AYP benchmark increases <coughs> again. Um, so reading, we are shooting for 93.5% proficient or advanced and math, 89.5% proficient or advanced because the following year it's 100%. And that is, I think, part of the reauthorization that you're starting to hear about, that that's becoming a target that most districts are not able to reach. And you may or may not be aware that um, our state has submitted an ESEA waiver to No Child Left Behind, which will be granted. All that's needed is the, the, the peer review process where we'll make tweaks to that waiver so that it's in compliance with what um, the U.S. Department of Ed feels that we should be doing in terms of accountability as a state. With that waiver, I want you to be aware of what that does to us for next year's WKC. We now know that the cut scores, remember that tutorial we just watched, will no longer be just 25 points ahead to stay proficient. It'll be more than double that. Because as part of the waiver, the state has said we will change our cut scores on the WKC to be determined what's proficient or advanced to match the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is a much higher level. And I want you to be aware of that because when that data comes out, we're not going to be able to compare our students the way we have in the past up until this point. And in terms of preparing for that, CESA 5 is preparing a media event because I think we have a lot of education to our stakeholders about what that means in terms Laurie, of student achievement. Yes. Lori, just a question. Yes. What you just said in terms of the higher yes. standard, that's not been achieved anywhere by anyone in any state ever. No. But yet, that's the goal. It Correct. used to be called a uh, bodacious, audacious <laughs> goal. And its objective was to stimulate and inspire people to reach. But it was never intended to be used as a weapon. Yes, that's, that's correct. All. That's correct. That should be part of our media just, event. Just to kind of give you a sense of what we're talking about, and it's not the best you know, study of, of the impact, but the Dane County Group of Directors of Instruction, the Monona Girls School District, took it upon themselves to look at WINS data, and they have a data person full-time who looked at all the Dane County schools and tried to predict what percentage of students would score proficient or advanced with the NAEP cut scores, and about, on average, it's anywhere from 30 to 40 percent across their districts. So that gives you a sense of the increased rigor of that NAEP cut score. Okay, so CESA 5 is going to help us communicate with our, our stakeholders about that. I think, though, there's another piece that's important in terms of that. With our ESEA waiver, like I said, it was submitted to the U.S. Department of Ed on February 22nd. We just learned over spring break from our DPI that due to the waiver, 
Wisconsin will no longer be required to produce AYP reports. Typically, I assume in the past you've heard in June or July what our AYP report is. Did our district meet those AYP benchmarks? So there are four benchmarks for each grade level. Not just reading and math, it's also based on attendance and graduation rate. And um, I forget the fourth one. Oh, those are the four, reading, math, and attendance and graduation. <laughs> and, and you will see that now in lieu of those AYP reports, the district will receive school report cards for the first time that will be based on that ESCA waiver that the state submitted to the U.S. Department of Ed. And we really are not in a position to give you much detail about what that's going to look like because we are waiting to see ourselves what that's going to look like. So as I understand it, sometime this summer, Crystal will be the first to get our school report cards. And as a district, we'll have an opportunity to learn about them, understand what they mean, and then they will be publicly, or it's anticipated at least, that they'll be publicly released to all of you in August. <coughs> so I'm not sure if we will be rated with those AYP benchmarks or if they will focus more on the gains or growth that we're making at each grade level and factor that into our report cards. The initial report card is going to be based on a WKCE though, correct? Correct, what, what because that's they all they have. They haven't been collecting like math data, for example, or, or other internal data that we are collecting. But isn't that where the waiver would be going? So they're going to do the initial report based upon the old system. Correct. Okay. We're in a, a place of transition, and I think it's important as a board to note the anxiety that can cause for our staff. Because they yes. don't know the answers to those questions themselves. And the confusion that will cause for the public. That's correct. Yes. Well, that's why I also think it's very important for you to continue and for us to continue to highlight um, the tracking and the success that our students are making year after year after year and the focus uh, that the district and our teachers and the staff have put on continuing to sustain that regardless of external meaningless measures we should be pretty confident that we know what we're doing and we should not be steered from that Belief. And I just thought it was really important that you have the most current information that we have, and there's so much more coming, I think, in the next few months in terms of our accountability measures. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Lori. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> We're just to the portion of the agenda entitled Personnel Recommendations. Um, and Trust that the board all received the addition to the approval of resignations, which was number four, uh, which was forwarded to you late last week, and that is from Melissa Wright at the Al Beerman Elementary School first grade, so that we have four resignations to act upon. I would entertain a motion for the first, which is Dan Hulbert from the high school associate principal position. I move to approve the uh, resignation of Dan Hulbert. Second. Motion by Mearing, seconded by Cummings. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried, resignation accepted. That brings us to Deb Hallberg, the high school media specialist position. Entertain a motion to that effect. Move to approve um, the resignation of Deb Hallberg, high school media specialist. Second. Motion by Mearing, seconded by Mr. Mortimer. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of acceptance of the resignation signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried, resignation accepted. And that number three would be Lindsay Muscanero, which is a West Kindergarten position. Entertaining motion to that effect. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Mortimer, seconded by Mr. Mearing. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried, resignation accepted. And the last is Melissa Wright, again, at Elberman Elementary, first grade. Entertain a motion to that effect. I'll so move. Second. Motion by Mearing, seconded by Cummings. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. And resignation accepted brings us to the approval of new hires, of which we have none on the agenda. 
There were three postings uh, for approval. Uh, the first one may need some uh, background information. Um, Bill or Lori, could I have you talk to the world language position? Yeah. Um, the position that we are proposing for tonight it really comes out of a necessity that exists between both the high school and, and middle school staff. Uh, presently at the high school right now, we are in a position where we're going to be offering 47 sections of world language next year in both Spanish and French. We have the staff to be able to do that, offer 40 sections without moving to an overload situation. We have, we'll have three staff next year to teach three. Uh, three staff will be at a full overload. Another person will be doing a six-five assignment. And that's, this is the second year in a row now that we'll be in that situation. Um, and we're really in a position right now in the area of French where we have more sections than we have qualified teachers to teach. Uh, Kim Kirsten, who presently teaches uh, French, could, is doing a full overload. She can teach 12 sections of French. We need 14 sections of French to increase numbers, largely because of the efforts that have taken place at the middle school to increase the interest and, and success of the program. Um, and so after having some conversation about trying to do some sharing of staff between the middle school and high school to cover that, it became pretty clear that, that uh, they had some needs as well. And consequently, uh, we're making a recommendation to add a 100% uh, French Spanish position that would be shared between both the middle school and the high school to address both schools' needs. And maybe just to add to that, in enforcing a share between the middle school and high school without an addition, we would have to change our availability of courses offered to students and the level that they can achieve in French going into the high school because we would have to shift the schedule at the middle school to accommodate for the inability to share because teachers are needed here at the same time that they're needed there. Is this just a newer thing where we're just getting more students taking? I think it's due to increased, yeah, increased attendance in the classes. Okay. Because the dual certification is um, more unusual, that's why we're coming to the board now and sure. not waiting for all of our staff needs to talk about it so we can get a posting out. Okay. So, so the recommendation then is to, just so I understand it clearly, is to hire somebody that we could utilize in either position, the French or the Spanish. No, they would have a dual certification in both. Um, we are going to post in such a way, or we would like to post in such a way, though, that we we um, we are looking for Spanish with a preference with French, or the ability to to work on that additional certification. Okay. We do have, if we find somebody with just Spanish, we we may be able to juggle some of our current staff. We prefer not to do that because the people that we have are performing well at those levels that they're at right now. So it's one of those kind of problems, but it's a good problem to have because it shows that more of our students are, are electing to participate in foreign language. Okay, thank you for the background. I would entertain a motion to approve the posting of the high school, middle school, French and Spanish teacher at 100%. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Vidro, seconded by Mr. Mearing. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carried. That brings us to the high school associate principal position. Entertain a motion for that posting. Move to approve. Second. Mr. Mearing with the motion. Mr. Cummings with the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carried. And lastly, the high school media specialist for the posting. I'll move to approve that. Second. Motion by Mr. Mearing, seconded by Mr. Pedro. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Posting period. We have no approval of long-term substitute positions at this point, so that brings us to the working session of the agenda. I appreciate those administrators that have stuck with us tonight. Um, <laughs> acceptance of the donation to the agriculture program. Um, so the board received a copy of uh, the donation and uh, gift receipt that was sent out by Director of Business Services, Mr. Long. I think it's pretty self-explanatory what the donation was. I don't hope I'm getting the name right. It's Is it McEwen? Farms? Yes. Of Mount Horeb and the items that were donated, just for the record, um, 750 packs of summer kind seeds, 
um, sweet basil, 925 packs, moss curled bar parsley, four, 942 packs, and then common basil, 795 packs. Those are worth a dollar a piece. So that was $3,400 to $3,412. And then biodynamic plant and soil treatment kits. Is that the soil mixture? What exactly is that? I don't know. Fertilizer? Or? <laughs> Bi biodynamic plant and soil treatment kits, which it says is organic biodynamic kits. 200 of those valued at $56 for $11,200 brings the total value of the donation to $14,612. And that was to the Baraboo High School Ag Department. So I think just an acknowledgement and an official acceptance of the gift by the board would be a good move. And a thank you. And a thank you, which <laughs> we can certainly send a thank you in addition to Mr. Long's, but he did send that. Already. Oh, sure. Well, thank you, what, Is one this too. a seed farm, or what is this? <laughs> yeah, there are seed, a local seed farm out of Mount Horeb, and I'm, I'm not sure what their, their background is. It just says that it's for use for the Baraboo Vocational Agricultural Greenhouse or for resale to create income to support the FSA-based <coughs> programs. So the donation was with no strings attached. Um, I believe they're moving to the Baraboo area, aren't they, Jim? Yeah, it was a yeah. venture that they began gearing up for and uh, decided in the end that it was not going to make sense for their business plan. So um, this fellow, um, I forgot what his name is, starts with a G. Anyway, um, came, um, the, these, this stuff came to him and um, they've decided to move into the Baraboo area, and he is very active uh, in, in that field of agriculture education down there and plans on being very active up here as his kids go through our That's school. That's Mr. Grunzel? Yeah. Jeffrey? Okay. <coughs> so I would entertain a motion to officially accept the gift. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Mortimer, seconded by Mr. Cummings. Any further discussion? Those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Long, for the letter of acceptance, and thank you to them. And if you need it, we can certainly send another one. Brings us to B, the track renovation bid and contract recommendation. Um, Mr. Cummings, as chair of BG&T, um, asked that I report out from the activities of the BGNT committee of last Thursday. Um, maybe just a little brief background, and please, committee members, feel free to add to uh, my comments or add your own comments. When we originally looked at the project through point of beginning, and I know we have at least one representative here from point of beginning tonight, correct? Um, the anticipated project was to be the redevelopment of the running track. Well, that project expanded to include a modification to the field to allow for uh, regulation soccer and also for the reconstruction of the football field. Our board budgeted $500,000 towards that project several months ago <coughs> with the expectation that we would be able to accomplish our task with the half a million dollars that the board set aside. Keep in mind that there was no request for bids for a new press box, new bleachers, new bathroom facilities, um, another of other things that had been in the discussion with the committee, but that were beyond the, the scope of what the financing could accomplish. What we talked about on Thursday night were six specific areas of contracts first of which was the general construction, the second was the asphalt pavement, the third was the running track surface itself, um, there was an additional one for irrigation, a chain link fence was another contract, and then lastly the electrical signage and uh, donor recognition seat wall area was the last of the bids that we opened up on Thursday night. Some of them re we received multiple bids for, some of them we received a single bid. Um, it was the recommendation of the committee, uh, Mr. Mortimer, Mr. Cummings, and myself to forward 
and we individually went through each one and recommended the acceptance of the ones that are to come before the board tonight for approval. There was some discussion when we got to the last one, which was the electrical signage and seat wall contract, which uh, was really kind of the contract that put us over budget-wise, including our $500,000 and $150,000 of money that was indicated has been set aside from fundraising efforts, and feel free to chime in, Mr. Andres. Um, that was unsolicited, too, the 150. It was, I guess the better way to put it maybe is without a lot of push in fundraising, you started with $150,000. Correct. Yeah, 50000 was a, a gift from a single person, and the 100000 was uh, left over from various activities, whether it was fundraising through my office for the last three years or uh, different retirement parties that benefited the track project, or just various things. So, again, from the committee standpoint, I think, and again, I will ask Gary and Ed to chime in. Um, there was an acceptance of moving forward with the project. Um, there was some concern about the overage as far as the budget. Um, we lastly, uh, and we picked the bid for the electrical portion, which is also the signage and the seat wall. Uh, for the sake of bringing it for the rest of the board, it was recommended that we, we bring it to the full board for discussion um, and potential approval. So rather than having a lump sum of the project moving forward or not moving forward, we broke it down into the contracts that were presented to us and what I would like to do is go through them individually with the recommendations from the committee uh, that we held at our meeting from our meeting on Thursday night um, I do want to point out we do have mr. Uh, Horswell is it yes. from H&H &H that's here um, the first contract that we looked at was the general construction contract of which mr. Horswell when he was commenting during the public viewpoints made mention of um, I want to point out that the recommendation from the committee was to um, recommend to the board to accept the contract, the lump sum contract from Dean Bloom Excavating of Baraboo, which was for $374,500. Um, there's a couple of different points to that bid, and H&H &H Civil Construction, of which, which Mr. Horswell is representing, the difference between Dean Bloom's construct, excavating bid and H&H &H Civil Construction's bid was $5,000, which as far as in a percentage is less than 1.4%. But there were a couple of other aspects to the bid that are not in the lump sum. Um, and we talked about that at the committee level. There was a couple of different uh, additional unit prices for number one, over excavation, and for number two, uh, additional breaker runs. So even though there is a difference in the initial lump sum, and as explained the committee's recommendation was to offer it to Dean Bloom which was actually the second low bidder um, if you take into account the over excavation and the breaker run we don't have any positive um, outcome that the bid in the end wouldn't be less or more from Dean Bloom than it was from H&H &H. there's a value of those two items that values them $5, the, or the the lump sum amounts again were 369 500 from H&H, &H, 374 500 from Dean Bloom. There was a discussion about replacing the goal posts, but when we determined that the goal posts were less than five years old, I think the committee's recommendation that we remove and then reset the goal posts as opposed to replacing them, because in the bid process there was a request for a price to replace the goal posts. Okay. Um, but the additional monetary value came in with the over excavation uh, request what would it be for over excavation which was seven seven dollars and fifty cents a cubic yard from H&H &H and six dollars and ninety five cents a cubic yard from Dean Bloom and also the additional breaker run which was explained to us as fairly large gravel that would be used in drainage areas mm -hmm. um, and there was a difference in $25 per cubic yard from H&H &H to $16.20 per cubic yard for Dean Bloom Excavating. Okay. Um, I certainly want to acknowledge uh, what Mr. 
Carswell said earlier that H and H, as a lot of contractors do, when they put a bid together, they put significant hours together to put the bid in. Um, I, we had another area of the contracts where we had multiples to look at. Uh, we had four bids on the chain link fence. Um, so not everybody that bids, and that's just part of the process. Not everybody that bids is going to get the bid, and you go into it knowing that's part of part of doing business. But. I would open it up for a motion or for a question in regards to the first contract, which we refer to as contract A, which was the general construction. I got a question. I've seen in the paper how it was advertised for all the bids, for all the wants. I didn't see none of this in the paper. How did these guys get contacted for the, to, be, to be bidding on this project? It's an open bid process that is advertised in the paper where anybody can submit bids for the project. That was in the because I've seen, I seen the one for all the wants that we're talking about, but I didn't see nothing in the paper for any of these, any of this stuff at all. Yeah, the, the, elect, the wants that you're talking about, the electrical and signage bid package was separate from the initial advertisement. So the initial advertisement had the first five contracts that were mentioned and then the electrical and signage was a separate advertisement that came out about a week later. Well, I know we're dealing with A, but can I get, when we start talking about this and we, we all of a sudden have this signage thing, can all of these be done without doing the signage thing? I mean, if the, we. If the we issue that we have with that is as Aaron uh, starts the fundraising, organized fundraising efforts, is that's all part of the recognition of the people that are providing donations. So if we don't have that critical piece, he has nothing to share with those donors at this time. So in, in talking with several board members, you know, it would be my recommendation, there's still an intent to. to kick off this fundraising uh, efforts over the next couple of months. Um, we, we'd like the board to give Aaron some time. He's got an organized committee. They have tiers already uh, identified of potential donors. Uh, we need an opportunity to, to fundraise with, with the original intent that we have this recognition for these individuals. I know, because when we look at this, and I'm saying at the bottom we get to a number of 816 versus we're really at 650 monies that we've allocated, plus donated money and, and monies that have been placed in the past. <laughs> I'm wondering how are we looking at the rest of that, the difference between the 650 and the 816. And, Another um, 150 is Would forward. this be a good time to maybe even address that, even though we're looking at A, Kevin? Yeah, I know. There's, we have no motion. We can talk about the project. Okay, why don't we talk about the whole thing and, and looking at when we get down to that bottom number, Aaron and, and Crystal, if you want to pipe in together, sure. what we're looking, what well, is our plan? When we look at the total total package of the plan, I'm, I'm estimated around nine hundred thousand dollars. When you look at all the fees lumped together uh, for this project, and there's something else besides what we're having here too. Well, we have architect fees. We have a growing process fee because um, we're going to try to do grass between now and next fall, so that's not just going to happen. Uh, so there's an accelerated grass growing and, uh, option that we'll, we'll have to pick up, otherwise we'd have to get sod in sure. order to use it this fall. And if we can't use it this fall, I need to come up with a plan for soccer and football, but uh, fairly quickly. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the group that, that we have that's kind of been going through this process has developed a fundraising plan and it's, it's labeled basically in three tiers and they've identified people that they think have, they have an interest in donating and maybe have the means to do that as well um, and kind of label them in priority as to who goes to them, maybe people with personal relationships with them mm -hmm. uh, and which people you know will um, be face-to-face -face contacts who will ask for larger amounts of money. Uh, people who will receive phone calls, people who receive letter information. Um, and so we've identified that already, and I worked with Matt Pellin to create a website uh, that's in process right now that we're hoping to direct people to that will give them uh, a place to donate via credit card uh, off our school PayPal account, uh, as well as just give people you know, an option to, to write a check. Um, the, three, the three major programs affected by that area would be football, soccer, and track. Uh, that's around 300 athletes. Um, the head coaches have committed to putting um, letters in the hands of those athletes that they're going to give to five people outside of our community who they feel support them and ask them for money. You know, whatever mm -hmm. donation they want to give, 
uh, we'll recognize that on our sign board as a, as a donation to our facility. Um, but that's 300 people times five uh, letters going out to people, and hopefully those people respond to us uh, with some donations. Uh, booster clubs from those organizations, including the youth that have youth, um, have already made some commitments. Uh, and I would expect the high school people to match that. Uh, the SOS Fest has been putting money away every year for a project like this. I'm not sure what number they've stored away, but I would hope they could donate uh, a large amount to, to help get this started. Uh, and I think people are ready in the community to donate to a project like this. We haven't gone to people for uh, large building needs uh, in a long time. And uh, when you look at our extracurricular facilities, they've been the same since the buildings have been built. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they were state of the art, uh, but obviously we've been passed by. And we have some really significant needs, and uh, it's a showcase for our school district. And I think, you know, if you guys give me the go ahead to get this done, you know, maybe it's a 60 day window we can set with these companies that, yeah, we're going to move forward. You know, some of the money's going to be due up front, but a lot of it's not going to be due to until later. Um, that we can go out and get this fundraising done and get those things done. Uh, when I, in terms of people talking about wants, I don't see a lot of wants in this in this package. Yep. Um, there are some signage things that we're trying to do, um, but I think that just draws to the aesthetics of our school building, um, our extracurricular offerings, and just showcases Baraboo schools in general. Uh, right now we have a sign out there that honors the Barrel Newman people who helped move the field from Roundtree up to this area. Uh, and it's, it's covered in plastic and it's faded and you can't, can't read the names on it. And so in our picture, we incorporate all those old sponsors. On one side, we have a, we're gonna have a nice picture of our facility. On the other side, we have a new sponsor. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that takes some money to get that done. Uh, but I'm hoping that we can go out and fundraise and get those other pieces to cover that. Okay. Uh, and that would be phase one. And in phase one, the things that occur here are obviously crowning the field, in-ground irrigation and drainage that connect to the track drainage. It's a nine-lane track. The jump pits move out, which allow us to host WI uh, soccer games there uh, legally. Uh, it gives us a walking path around the south end of the track. It fences in the track with a four foot high fence. It redoes the fence around the exterior of the building, uh, of the facility. Uh, it dresses up our entry gate, moves our ticket booth around, allows for better traffic flowing on both sides of our ticket booth. Uh, puts in a new scoreboard, which is not part of the cost. That's all going to be donated by, by local businesses. Uh, with cost covered and bringing in some, some yearly um, some money from those businesses past this first year. Uh, and it takes some of that earth that's being moved and it's going to level out the far side for possibly a future bleacher pad. Um, so that's phase one. And it covers a lot of things. The other piece it brings is that it brings water and sewer from Draper Street across through the, through the track on the south end of the field over to the other side of the stadium for future growth, which could incorporate a concession stand restroom. Uh, a bleacher set and a new press box. Right now, uh, we don't have enough seats for people that attend contests, and we don't have a press box that can fit what we put in there on a, on a nightly basis. Uh, so those are things that we're putting in phase two, and you know, depending on how fundraising goes, you know, I, I, right now I think we need to get to nine hundred thousand dollars to feel comfortable with this project. So you know, raising another three hundred thousand dollars, but if we can go three hundred to five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars, we'll see how far we can get. But it, it, it takes some momentum. Uh, I think having a timeline on it's a positive thing for us to have an, an end time so that we can get somewhere and tell people that we have to get this done by a certain point and that'll be motivating people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to take somebody to step up and, and give us some donations and, and uh, share that information with the public and say, hey, here's what's, what's happening right now. Be a part of this project. Well, <clears throat> I want to say a couple things. Um, we added up the bids and we added point of beginnings fee and it came up at 874,000. Now you're saying 900,000. Right around there. Yeah. Which is probably closer because there's going to be some, some uh, extras, no doubt in my mind. <clears throat> so the board did allocate 500,000 last year, I believe. Okay, we had the one donation for 50,000. And now you said tonight you've got a hundred thousand set in, in your accounts. Not in mine. Yeah. Downtown. Well, okay, well, whatever. Yep. Okay, so that comes up to six hundred and fifty thousand. So you subtract the two, we're two hundred and twenty four thousand dollars short. Yep. Now, there are I I thought the other night when we talked that in the electrical bid, 
a scoreboard to integrate and seat uh, entry gate and seat wall were included in that. Mm -hmm. the scoreboard's not. The structure for the scoreboard and the signage for the business sponsors that will go along with the scoreboard are in that box. But the actual scoreboard itself is being bought by local business. Okay, okay. So, but we're still $224,000 short. Now, I'm thinking we have to find a way to cut that somewhat because we, we talked before that the entry gate, some of these things are not really a necessity right now. And the way the economy is and things, these are things we could do next year or the year after. It's not really a priority. The priority is the track itself. Or what are you going to do? I don't feel comfortable going to the taxpayers and asking for 900000 Well, you, is you, there a, you, don't, you don't have to. Is, is there a way we could, uh, obviously I didn't attend the meeting, so I've, I've got a different perspective than you guys that have logged all these hours and looking at this project. Is there a way we can, you know, it looks to me well laid out here and that you've got A, B, C, D, E, and F, uh, which basically A, B, C, D, and E build the infrastructure and construct the track. The The question I had seems to be similar to yours, Ed, and that's the, the F, which is the electrical signage seawall and recognition area. I, I support that concept. I, I like that idea. I get that. Um, when, when our company donates funds, we're not looking for recognition, but there's a lot of people that the minute they write you a check, they want to see their name and they want to see it lit 24-7 in, um, in appreciation for their token. But is there a way we can ag agree to the idea but not nail down this concept and accept this bid? Because I don't know if we've all seen it. Can we say we are building a recognition area? We're just not sure ultimately what it's going to look like. Because here's my reservation. You're going out fundraising, and the first hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars that you fundraise has to go to pay to recognize the people that are donating the first hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars. That's a pretty aggressive um, recognition process. I mean, it. Well, out of that, out of that cost, Sean, that's a good. I'm glad you brought that up. The cost to recognize people isn't isn't that large. The cost to recognize people is approximately fifteen thousand. The seat wall area specifically, where Aaron wants to put the donor recognition sign, the seat wall itself, that area is sixteen thousand dollars. And so the hundred thirty-seven also includes electrical lines that are existing that are in conflict with the project that need to be relocated. It's to improve the PA system. It's to add security lighting. So there are certain things that are not just donor recognition or wants. There are certain electrical needs that are in the project. Is it possible to recognize that there's aspects of this could, that could be broken out and rebid in hopes of gaining additional attention and additional bids? Um, is there uh, you know, a reason I don't know, why those I don't know how the bid was staged, but is there bid? an electrical contractor that looked at a, a seating malaria and said, I'm not, I'm, you know. Can I that, add something to it? I don't know if I'm on the line here. Oh. Sure, but on the electrical end of it, we didn't bid that portion, but the numbers that we got were substantially lower than the numbers that you received. So well, and, and Whenever I see one bid, I'm, when I see two bids, I say, okay. When I see five bids, I'm like, great. But when I see one bid, I wonder if there is an opportunity for us to review the process. And if it is, you know, something we can take a look at, breaking it out differently, maybe articulating it differently, bidding it differently so that we get better results or different results. Um, when you say it's only $16,000 for recognition, well, that's, that's a small commitment for the amount of, uh, resources you're going to gain uh, you know so I have no problem with that but maybe we just need to understand this a little bit better this section of it and, and get some but get going on moving the earth I mean I well and I, I don't know what the effect of if, if the board's decision is to hopefully approve the contracts for everything but potentially the last one I don't know how that affects the rest of the project I don't 
But yeah. I think the question becomes is that obviously you're saying, well, yeah, maybe I, I, you know, obviously I first look at it not knowing the project and saying, oh, I just want to pull that out. But I think you're telling me that if I got to move, I've got lighting and other stuff, and I'm pulling up all this dirt, I got a probably a significant amount of that 137. It's probably still going to have to occur, whether I say I want it to occur or not, if I want A through E to occur, correct? Yes, yes. I mean, the purpose of breaking out the bids into these six packages is not because these three we really need and these three we don't, but we're trying to get that through is to get competitive bids so that we get packages that are easily bid upon that aren't going to get marked up and it's going to be competitive as possible. Um, so yeah, I would say that the reason that that package is there, it's electrical items and signage items that were easily packaged together. Some of them were necessity and some of them are going recognition and some of them are just part of the ambiance of the facility. But the well, I guess as, as a board member, I look at it this way, that where, where I recognize bid packages that have multiple bids as being a competitive process, I look at a, a bid package that has one bid is perhaps maybe we didn't do our job, just getting it out to the right, getting the right response. You know, as a board, is there a way we can get a better response on this this parcel? I mean, anecdotally, we've had somebody stand up in the audience and say that there's better numbers out there. Well, um, I, 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 okay, and I'll concede the fact that it needs to be done 100 percent, that all the steps need to be done, uh, especially when you have lines in conflict and you have, you know. You have excavators moving dirt, and obviously lines of conflict are a problem, and they've got to be dealt with with an electrician. But uh, recognize that, that it all needs to be done. Is there a way we can rebid one part of it? What, what does that do to the timeline of the project in terms of going through another bidding process for that portion? Well, there are certain, there are certain things in this package that we may be able to. The, the big thing is that if we want to play football on this field this fall, it needs to be seated by the end of May, which means in the next couple of weeks we need to have our excavator out on site disturbing that field. So that's the current timeline right now. So that electrical portion is something that wouldn't have to go immediately, though, that we could take some time to okay, figure out how we can get some things out of there, um, possibly do some things that could take a little bit longer as long as the excavation portion of it is the most important right now for the field itself so that we can get that seeded, get the grass mature enough so that we can get athletes on it this fall. Um, I would say that in that electrical package, like we said, there are certain things that we may be able to um, weed out or phase or stage. Uh, we do have uh, the, the bidder for that package is actually here. Uh, I would recommend that we give him an opportunity to speak toward what he has in that package. Well, actually, the electrical bid, your your electrician parts, only about thirty-seven or forty thousand dollars, right? For the electrical, for the electrician, whether it's whether it's tails or whether it's whomever. So my question: What's the other hundred thousand for? Are those necessities, or are they um, wants? For example, like the gate and so on, which we can do later when we have more money. Right. Is my point because I don't want to go to the taxpayer and say we're going to spend nine hundred thousand dollars and then have a big fancy press box and uh, all this other fancy stuff with the economy and people out of jobs and home foreclosures and I, I I don't feel I just can't do that. Right. You're from Tim. I am. I'm from um, Tim's Lighting Company. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Cullen. I'm the president of the company and uh, I can understand your apprehension. Uh, and it's obviously uh, a little bit of a different situation with one bidder. But I'd just like to speak honestly and openly on how this uh, happens. We submit a bid for this package, okay? We're a sign company with electrical experience. We've done uh, similar projects at St. Albert College, UWGB, a number of high schools, et cetera. And quite often, I've this is the first time that all of a sudden we're the only bidder. So, um, but in our bid, we're putting together electrical bids and we're getting multiple bids. In this, our submittal, we have a bid from Action Electric and we also have one from Hills Wiring. So it's not like you're getting one number. Our signage number, 
uh, the way the sign package came together, I know um, there was multiple providers of scoreboards um, involved in the project. I know Nevco uh, product was looked at as well as All-American. Um, we had multiple bids as far as concrete and the signage package and the electrical go hand in hand. Footings for the scoreboard, which are in this bid, are very similar to footings for the light poles. Are you going to bring in someone to pour separate footings in the whole thing, you know, from one to another, or is the same contractor going to be awarded because it's really the same work on the same premise? It just makes sense to put it all together. So that's a little bit of the reason why this work goes in the same area. Uh, as far as the entry gate ties directly in with your scoreboard, as well as um, that seat wall area. And as this vision was put together, a lot of these things came about and were designed and put into it. Um, I don't know, I just wanted to let you guys uh, in on how we put our numbers together for this. Uh, obviously, we did not intend to be the only bidder. Um, I'm very um, involved in my own school district and community um, as far as projects and donations, um, similar to what you're doing on your facilities here. I don't know if there's any other questions for me as a contractor and bidder uh, that I can answer for you, but I just want to know. Well, the, Mr. Mr. Mortimer brought up a point I'd like to, is it Scott? Is your first name Scott? Brian Mars. Brian, sorry. Brian. 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 Um, in referencing the footings for the for the lights, those are, that, that does not involve, involve moving the existing light standards that are in place. This is adding lighting for the entranceway and behind the grandstand, or what are we, what are we talking about? Yeah, part of the request of the track renovation committee was to add security lighting by the, which it would be behind the existing press box in that area where the new jumping events are going to go. That area is going to be fenced in, but there was a desire, uh, including by Patrick Acker, to add lighting in that area. So there are light security lights and light bases that would be involved. Okay. But, but in the original blueprint, or original print, you didn't show those three new lights, did it? Correct. But behind the bleachers you're talking about? Yeah, which print are you talking about? On, on those ones that you gave us? Back in, was Jan back in January when we were going through the master planning process, they were not. That's something that was added during the several meetings that you had with the committee. Because you move some of those events. Yeah, the jumps uh, yeah. before were inside the track, which were inside the playing surface. So when those are moved behind the current bleachers, all of our lights were facing the field. And so we have several track meets where jumps occurring for the, the dark. So we needed to have lighting over there, and it was just something that had to happen. Aaron, didn't you say that uh, Tony could? Water the whole field easily with that wheel. I, I brought uh, that up before, and yeah, it's just it's just hitting, taking about a you know an hour every day. Yeah. So every day to set up and take down and because we can spend it going So when, couldn't we save twenty some thousand dollars there? As far as Not putting the watering system in. As far as the irrigation of the field, if you want to irrigate it with the water wheel, it, it won't do as adequate of a, a job. You're going to miss the edges which is fine, but I, I won't say that we'll put down seeds this spring and that you'll be able to plant it this fall just because of the consistency of the water and the <coughs> that to go out from water. If you have that water on an automatic system, it's, it's a very aggressive schedule to be able to get grass to grow in 12 weeks and get it mature enough so that you can play football on it for the season. Um, a lot of places, a lot of people in the state won't do that. They'll say, okay, how many seasons do we have to take off of football? You know, because most places, we're working in Jefferson right now, and where they're going to reconstruct the football field this year. They're going to play their games elsewhere for this coming season, and then next year they'll play on that field. 
And what we have is an aggressive, like Aaron mentioned, the growing program where we overseed it, we over fertilize it, we aerate it, and including in that is the irrigation. Well, I think it's important that we recognize um, the funding status of this too. This has never been a $500,000 project that has somehow grown to $900,000. This has been a project that has been born out of necessity. And last year we were able to allocate $500,000 to this project knowing that um, we did not have the size and scope of it clearly defined because we had not allocated any money to it at all. So we didn't have any kind of architect, we didn't have any kind of review, we didn't have any kind of space needs or true understanding of the enormous undertaking that we've got in front of us. Um, so I just want to make sure that everybody clearly understands that this hasn't gone, these aren't cost overruns, these aren't, you know, just a, a project gone wild. This clearly is a project that just had some seed money put at it. Now we've got to figure out how to get the rest of the way there. I want to bring up too that the reason the seed money was put there was because there were safety issues with the track. And we were at a point where we were looking at, and other teams were looking at not not using yeah. it. Well, I mean, so, I mean, it was it was evident that that our track was in complete disrepair. I think the only thing worse is the GLW parking lot. But um, it, and while we recognize that we need to do some of these things in phases, you know, the wants versus the needs, we also wanted to create a vision and a, a, a model of what we wanted in the future so that we were working smarter and not harder and undoing some of the work that had been done in previous years as we continue to, to implement some of these upgrades. So. Again, we, we obviously keep talking in, uh, about sports, and obviously this impacts three sports, but this is also a FIAT facility. I mean, we use it for both middle school and high school. I don't know if uh, GLW uses it, but I, I know at least we have at least two of our major facilities that are using it on a regular basis. So, uh, and community members use it too. And and I've run around that track, and it is a safety issue, and uh, uh, we need to address that issue. And obviously, part of addressing that issue is there are other factors that come into play. But you know, people if um, as we deal with other groups like the Baraboo Economic Development Corporation, they want to make people want to move to Baraboo. And it's important that we address this issue or other issues like this so that we are a showcase. And I mean, I don't think we're not asking for a Cadillac, but we have to be able to say that we have a credible facility for people to want to come to our community. So I believe in this process. So, oh, Mr. Uh, Aaron, can I ask you and can I ask uh, the gentleman from Point of Beginning, um, in interest of moving this project along, what I'd like to propose to the board is the acceptance of bids A through E um, so that we can get contracts set out, we can get people in place, plans and schedules set. And then I'd like to say, is it possible for us to recognize that F is a priority, but we're going to give you time to get some fundraising going we can kick it over to finance to see what we've got going in next year's budget as far as prioritizing additional dollars out of there. And we can also review the bidding process and see, is that the right bidding process? Maybe we got the best number. Um, and, and is there anything that can be tweaked about that to help us reach our goal? Question for Mr. Cullen, if we were to proceed that way, is that something that uh, if, if the board were to not offer the contract on that particular part of the project at this point, and I know Representative from Hills is here too. Um, what what is what is going to get to a point of no return or a point of you not being able to do the project if if, if we if if we don't commit to spending the 130 to, to spending the money on whatever aspect of it is that we're going to do? Obviously, the electrical part of it for the majority of it's going to have to be done regardless. I mean, we're going to squibble about a $15,000 area for, for donations. Say we trim $20,000 off of it. Whatever we come up to, at some point, we got to do the project. What, what does that mean to you as somebody that bid on it and we're you know, potentially going to not act on the bid tonight? What does that mean to you? Obviously, all tied together. Um, definitely in this, not just the scoreboard. 
scoreboard. You know, it's realistic that your scoreboard is not going to have, you know, steel foundations or anything like that. Um, it's not going to have electrical circuit out to it. And the point of beginning should really answer this question, but I have that's been that's through this process. And when you lay down your track, you put your circuits here, and now you want a concrete truck over there and things like that. It's just a lot better when you're meeting weekly on construction and um, safety and everything like that. It's all tied together. All the contractor can say, I need to do this now. You set your timelines in your, your beginning meetings. And um, so that's the construction process when you're, when you're building the whole facility. Now, what can be left out? Um, there's some things that probably could be pushed off, like that entry fee. Um, but there's electrical circuits that run to that as well, and, and so on. So I, I don't know if I'm the guy to answer that question. I think the lead in construction. I, I think you, you, so you've right. answered it for me. Thank you. I want to say something, Kevin, here. You got make sure everybody understands that this started out as a track project with put a Band-Aid on the football field. And in the end, we've took care of the track project, fully upgraded the football field, and made a, a facility for soccer. So instead of doing one thing, we've actually done three things. Plus you fix the entry and egress of the property, which is a nightmare. Right. And, and the really only is. issue that we're so talking about, the if 500, you've 137. The 500,000 we put towards the track, now we've got two other sports to take care of, and you know, like since the football, track, soccer, and I believe the, the band practice on there too, or what have you, you know, and stuff. So uh, we're covering a lot of stuff here if we can find the funding. That's the. Well, in terms of the funding, Aaron, you've already committed to engage in fundraising. The finance committee, as John has indicated, ought to get together and look through some of the available funding, uh, as we have talked about, especially in terms of having uh, completed our last payments of various uh, loans, where money now is accessible at a very low interest rate over a period of time, so that we might be able to say, you need Aaron to raise X numbers of dollars, but we can be somewhat of a guarantee or over a period of time. If we're quibbling about, you know, thirty or forty thousand dollars on a nine hundred thousand dollar project and we're gonna wait until we have everything in place, we'll never get it done. So I I would like to applaud Gary, you know, your assessment I think we're doing a lot more than we ever planned. We're getting a lot more bang for the buck. I think finance should go back and take a look at where we might be able to um, find some ways to help, but we need to move ahead with this project or it's not going to happen. Might I suggest we just go through the, the contracts one at a time and let's vote them up or down and we'll see where we end up at the end. This coming out of the committee, the first which was contract A, general construction for the running track redevelopment without including the alternative at a cost of $374,500. That was for Dean to live excavating up there. I would entertain a motion to that effect. I will so move. I will second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Brings us to B, motion carries six to one. Brings us to B, which is the asphalt pavement for the running track redevelopment at a cost of $137,733 and 50 cents to DL Gasser Construction of Bearboot. Would entertain a motion to that effect? I will so move. I'll second. Motion by Cummings, seconded by Mearing. Any discussion? Hearing none, That's those good. in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Nope. Mr. Mortimer's opposition, and it passes six to one. 
brings us to the running track synthetic surface known as contract C for the running track redevelopment at a cost of $79,870 for Upper Midwest Athletic Construction of Anoka, Minnesota. I would entertain a motion to that effect. I will move. And I will second. Motion by Cummings, seconded by Nearing. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Notice Ms. Note Mr. Mortimer's opposition. Motion passes six to one. Brings us to D, irrigation for the running track redevelopment at a cost of $25,800. That is for Shelfer Enterprises of Plover. Entertaining motion to that effect. I will so move. And I will so second. Motion by coming, <coughs> by nearing. Any discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Who are the oppositions? Mr. Bortenhagen and Mr. Mortimer. The motion passes five to two. Brings us to item E, contract E, which is for the chain link fence that is for $61,000 for American Fence Company of Plover. Would you entertain a motion to that effect? I will so move. I will second. Motion by Cummings, seconded by Nearing. Any discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Mr. Mortimer, Mr. Porkenhagen, I didn't hear your vote. I said aye, didn't he? Aye. Okay. Note Mr. Mortimer's opposition passes six to one. Brings us to the last, which is the electrical signage seat wall at a total estimated at 137,103, 50 cents for Tim's lighting. Entertain a motion to that effect. So moved. Second. Motion by McNevin. Seconded by Bedro. Any discussion? Yes, uh, Sean. Is that uh, have uh, that's going to be funded through the school or? Well, the school's on the hook if the motion passes. Put it that way. Um, I, I guess we're going to look to Aaron at this point to see what kind of fundraising efforts we can do to offset this cost. But clearly, when the board adopts this resolution, it puts us financially. In, in, um, I would I would assume that there's opportunities for in kind contributions. Say there's a steel distributor that wants to put up the posts for the signage. Okay. So and those can be deducted from bid costs or allocated accordingly. Right. You have expertise in that area, Mr. McDonald. I we guarantee the sign just, won't be on the ground. Just say it. Maybe. Any further discussion? Uh, point of clarification. I just want to say this last bid. Um, I am in favor of this bid because without supporting this bid, we do not know what delays may arise if this is not in place. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion as presented signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. No. Mr. Mortimer and Mr. Porkenhagen's opposition. The motion passes five to two. We're at the point of the agenda where. Thanks, Aaron. Yes, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thank you. Doesn't get you off the hook. And <laughs> Brian. No. Now go start fundraising. Now. Watch going here. After all of that discussion, we can end our working session with the granting of a request for an out-of-state field trip, which may include five or six board members to Six Flags of Gurney, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> Absolutely. And their kids? Nope. Just board members. Oh. For May 23rd, 2012. So moved. <laughs> second. I'll second Motion by McNevin. Seconded by Miriam. Any discussion? Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carried. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Mortimer to be a second. Somebody's. I think it was raised.
Aye. 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 Aye.